Root arms. 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 Root arms rearm a rearming. Eighth day of war. An armature. Arms deployed. My arms around root arms. Armed forces. Arms force. The army cluster bombs. Gardens, hospitals. How to handle war, ground rules, cities shelled, shells for shores. How to get a handle on war, know together to get here. How to handle root arms, my hands. I teach children, hands plant seeds, make beauty, make friends. Make delicious, what power. Firearm here, firearm there. Fires, arm bottles, alcohol, gasoline flung. I am armless, I am armless. I am armless, I am face to face to face tank. I am hands on tank, stop. I am tank, I am stop giving birth, bomb shelters, giving birth, basements, giving air, giving air, giving air, giving air over Ukraine, 
close the sky, close skies closed, plants planted over, nuclear plants planted, Chernobyl melts. Who handles? Who measures? Root arms. Root arms. The cherry tree hangs a root arm for me, for you. Giant blush tipped octopus hands. Mycelium snowflake bursting from center brained. Light passes through. Food passes through. Medicine passes through. A piece of the larger. From roots to sky, from sky to roots, air passes through, water passes through, creation passes through, dark passes, need passes, love passes, care passes, action passes, synapses pass, sewing, mending, embroidered, I want to give back. A gift overflowing like tomatoes, a broccoli crown. In Ukraine, refugees line roads, ripped up by roots, mycelium wrapped. Relations calling and crossing borders, mirror mycelium, mirror virus, mirror ripples, mirror cysts, mirror egg path. Mirror what passes through a look, a hug, love. A look, a hug, love. Today we divine. Let the war be won. Let love be at its end, says the card. You're not breathing well today. How could you? Maria Primachenko. Kiev, museums, her paintings, bombed. We are racked with wreckage. Ask the roots, what to do, you say, a fluorescent ask. Do you think they could forgive us? Dove spread wings for peace. I visit the oak that hosts the magic mushroom, where my four-liter cyst now feeds. Where my four-liter cyst now feeds half in and out of the dream state between ghosts and morning over a cracked border my pen slips that cyst is feeding soil outside your body nourishing the oak in your backyard sheltering your daughter's playground and your gardens i am grateful In your kitchen, sky crinkled through her leaves, sitting with you, us, together, being, between, because time is, we are, belief. Oh, cysts, outside buried, what is the holy without the unholy? Thoughts, acorn squirrely, Pinnate swirled, bud and gloss, yellows turning inward. Where there is no horizon to dream on, I return to the planted and their truth, arming, rearming, disarming, desist, resist, released, cease, cyst. Cyst. Fantastic fungus, you dig threads into my roots. Today I am oak, am host, fully open, all sugar, carbs, your home. Filter my waste and toxins. What performance quality? Radioactive. Radioactive. I am hungry all the time. I want to put everything in my mouth. Ridge decorative cherries that taste like pine sap. Any leaf my hand passes outside my cement military family home. I chew tea leaves of 
bottle brush trees in remembrance of stolen unripe apples and left behind cedar needles. I sample red hibiscus petals, bitter kumquats, hard to husk coconuts, peach skin sea grapes, and papery barked malaluca leaves. I am learning the landscape as much with my tongue as with my eyes. Every fruit at the stand outside the armed gate looks suspect, cut open, runs slimy. Spicy guavas, seedy tomatoes, greasy avocados, turpentine fragrant mangoes, dripping seeds so large they have to be sucked. The oleander tree floats in pink flowers, has stories. Whole families dead from roasting hot dogs on fallen branches, still I reach for you. I want you between my lips until Linda, born amongst Point Siena and Gardenia, screams, stop. Last night in my dream, I walk by your branches on my way down coral steps that wind to the sea. I pass you by with friends dead and dying. We finish our last supper. I am still hungry. We finish our last supper. I am still hungry. Sky to the ground, dream succulents, mirrored imperfections. A perfect corona, you say, is hell on place settings. My daughter dreams a woman comes through her bedroom window, holding succulents she plants into the wall behind a piano. Here with you, I listen. I am here. What can we offer this moment but words? This war on the Slavs takes you to Croatia, your great-grandfather, a Serb who fought, who burned to his death. My daughter practices Russian. I adapt her sounds, her mouth to my ears. Moscow, Bolshoi, ballet. There's always Europe and lingerie. My body hurts. It's the bullshit cream on the cake that cuts the Kremlin's yeast. But St. Petersburg calls. St. Petersburg, where I wear an embroidered beret to sing a requiem for Ukraine. Its emblem... Vulgar tastes are not welcome. Consider the body. There is always Europe in a glass. Eight days not at the Bolshoi. Ballerinas wear khaki caps and rifles. Vulgar tastes not welcome. Vulgar tastes not welcome. I am a settler, invader, not native at home, in place not belonging to one stock and everything a nothing, boundless, bound, useless, grounded. Mix too many colors and get mud, my painter mother taught. So what, pick one, anyone, the largest, my Serbian father in school, peeing his pants, unable to ask to go to the bathroom. The first American revolutionary, English slaveholder, Dutch grocer, Scottish plaid, that rumored bit of illegitimate French wealth. A mud puddle, chipped sedimentary, metamorphic glacier water, seeping into soil, evaporating into compost for grafted apples decomposing quagmire to slog through, frogs leaping from. Decomposing quagmire to slog through, frogs leaping from. Helene says, language is a forest. Language a forest. All the roots audible. Read language by the roots. Language the roots. 
my foreignness, powerful in me. I am outside the outside, looking in. When I speak, it's we. Always we, it's the language and me inside it. Me with the language inside me who speak. When you and I speak, we are at least three. When you said the new moon went right into you, it went right into me too. Not earth to moon, not me to moon, but moon into me. With that line, you changed all points of view. Of view, your hemlock silhouette stands more familiar than my own distant mothers, brothers, sisters, even my own children's arbor constant body. Do you know my myelin? Does it web through your mycelium? Nighttime, your breath travels the swamp, ascends the slope towards my cracked window to blow in my face, close as my husband's breath. Are my footprints sponged into your net? While you stand watch, have you recorded all my joys and shortcomings, fatigue tantrums, a mother's inability? Hovering in place on the edge of the forest, do you hold the night the way I hold a hand, caress air like I caress soft skin on the inside of an arm? Are you taking what you need from me? Have you asked and have I answered in language? I do not know how I spoke. Caring, carefree, a girl's laughter. A child laughs like they breathe as much as 300 times a day. Have we been sharing smiles all along? Have we been sharing smiles all along? If Pastor Arango had remained sober in language, he would have said, I baptize you, not we baptize you. In the name of invalid, we deprive everyone of everything. We deprive ourselves of otherness. For Helene, de lune à l'autre, from one to the other becomes de l'une à l'autre. She folds in the feminine, becomes de l'une à l'autre, with the moon, with the other. Is this an echo poetics or an eco poetics? I can't help it. I always say echo poetics. I hear echoes. For Camille, a tree is never just a tree. A tree is a rememory. A tree is lynching. For Amy, the big tree in the Sonora Desert, the Sasabe tree lives as a marker of crossings. I hear border crossers resting beneath the mesquite. I hear border crossers look for water in the leaves of yuccas and agaves. I hear border crossers chewing roots of Joshua trees. I hear border crossers eating needles off prickly pears. I hear Lake Guatavita drained for gold. I hear Fray Lejones cry. I hear that nature holds no allegiance to nation. I hear that nature holds no allegiance to nation. Rearming. Scrabble word that ends the game. Triple word, M on the triple letter square. 50 points for using all seven letters. Everybody's letters added, then subtracted from our scores. Rearming, hyphen drops before peace in an ongoing file. Afghanistan, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, not enough letters for invasions in Ukraine. Rearming in subway stations, basements, 
parking garages, violins weeping in bunkers, strings rearming in a global symphony. Rearming, echoes, absent, assembles Molotov cocktails, gasoline spill and sound of ripped sheets garbles the tongue, smarmy with R's and a mispronounced silent A slams with tanks, bombs locked heavy in place, AK-47 wounds, concrete upended into fertile soil craters, wheat fields abandoned before shoots and roots wake from half-dead winter. Before shoots and roots wake from half-dead winter, The relationship with your mother is tight and small, you say. We listen to the war and ask, what are we doing? Our mothers sick, people turning into refugees by the minute. The cerebral cortex, memory's home, myelin resembling mycelium. Cerebral cortex keeping us human keeping memory, keeping us alive. Norby says when transplanting trees, it's important to keep roots from the air in order to live. Plant transplanting is always painful. Whenever asked, where are you from? I would say I was transplanted and feel the sound of that rip like roots torn from dirt. Fralejones live an hour from Bogota, where my mother was born and raised. She never met them, or the emerald green lakes of Siecha. She spent her life running. Angel trumpets outside her window told her, go. The scientist on the radio introduces a disc, the Magdalena filament, Milky Way's longest glass cloud named after the longest river in Colombia. This naming makes me long for the cloud. The Kogi people believe that to begin, in the beginning, Planet Mother laid invisible black thread to link coasts with mountains. What happens in one place echoes in another. Chernobyl was a dream. A child of stellar dust, I remain unhinged. Who watches over the mountain sarcophagus now? Nuclear waste rains, its core melting ground in the rain. In the rain, this morning, we watched the bomb maternity hospital over oatmeal and coffee. Last night, in front of heated up frozen Thanksgiving turkey soup, Snipers kill the family in the humanitarian corridor. War teaches geography. I've never been to Ukraine, but now I could find Kiev on a map in a pop quiz. There's a European war to watch, and nobody wants to work. There's a war to watch, and we haven't called our mothers. The pizza has a for sale sign in the window. The owner behind the counter can't be bothered, serves up my pizza lukewarm and doughy. If we find no labor, he says, we will close. If we can hire somebody, we will take down the sign. Everything's up. Everything costs. Ground thaws, snow covers, ground thaws, a spring blizzard on the way, and I still haven't ordered seeds. What is planted beside a nuclear power plant? What grows? Outside on the way to the beaver pond, I hear the barn cat's lonely call. The mother hemlock stands so close to the water's edge, it's a wonder she doesn't topple. What is planted in a nuclear power plant? Whose portrait on the wall needs a new frame? Without a frame, only paper. If you want to feel your toes, what's under your feet, know from what direction the wind blows. 
where the sun wakes and sets, where the full moons rise, where your family is. Keep backpacks and rolling suitcases handy, cell phones charged. Pick up the half barn wild cat and listen to her purr. What looks like a ditch could be an entrance underwater to a lodge. The mallard's head is the greenest emerald ever seen. The mallard's head is the greenest emerald ever seen. My window gallery, evergreens, black cherries, a Japanese cherry, mockernut hickory, sweet birches, white ash, my beloved three-legged elm. In what language does mycelium speak? We are migrant birds bearing walls and bearing straits, passengers of terror framed by maps. Plants are like immigrants, easy not to hear, easy to ignore. We stand tall shouting among devastations, listen to our dead with eyes closed. What does it take to listen to the planted? To the planted, succulents and sunshine, perfect Corolla, that sunshine we all crave, that crayon blue line a child draws at the top of a rough construction paper. The one mother explains is not real. Sky goes all the way to the ground, but so many strokes to tire a child's hand, each a mirrored imperfection. The line is hers, finite, blue like her eyes. Soon enough, sky will stretch riddled with gases. Same sky beneath where she will lose count of wars, tanks in her own country, foreign cities she will fail to pronounce, mixing up names of who is killing who and why the world pays attention to this war, a cousin to the one her Slav father lied to fight, her grandfather immigrated to avoid, and her great-grandfather was burned alive in. This war another streaming real time, cell phone, TikTok war, white. Blacks go back at the border war, Trump's best friends war, nuclear power plants lit up bright, Chernobyl revisited, world war, world war, world war. Ask the trees, they've seen it all, they know uprooted hi this is dan and i'm standing here with ellie and we're out on the canal way and digging a hole for, for a tree hi yeah it's glittery this morning there's snow and sun it's like classic winter spring grafting season planting season putting a hybrid chestnut into the ground digging in the soil that we just learned was dug for eleven dollars a month by immigrant labor, I think Irish and Scottish, um, two hundred years ago. I'm digging on the banks of that, um, amongst a pretty fascinating habitat of spontaneous plants. What are our plans at home? Our plans at home? Yeah, I think that was part of the prompt. Oh, I missed that for yeah. um, the spring. What are you up to? What are we up to? We're keeping our persimmon and our ginkgo street tree happy with some llama poop infusions and uh, seeing what comes back up in the front yard. Um, we're ripping up some asphalt and some turf at a longtime lawn parking lot, uh, making sure our little May May three-year-old gets lots of time outside with the multi-species community. What else? What else are we up to? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, hungry. I think she wants chocolate. Oh, that's right. May May is hungry. Well, we this... promised the toddler if she made it through tree planting, she would get a chunk of chocolate. Yeah. Although there's time. competitors here for that now. So. Uh-oh. We have more chocolate in the car. Oh, right. Yep. <laughs> 
All right. I think that we're also supposed to give our permission that you can use this. Uh, I, we we're consenting. To, we consent. Uh, to use it. Can you? Will you consent, Ginger Bee May May? Say I consent. I consent. All right. You know that means it. I want us to also, as we uh, maybe some of us are familiar with this moment, we uh, think about ideas of abolition in relationship to transformation. A lot of times we'll talk about transformative justice or restorative justice, but I think actual transformation, ideas of being an alchemist um, or a artist or a great recycler in relationship to notions of abolition, not only PIC abolition, but abolition as a, a, a practice, abolition as a philosophy, abolition in our each and every one of our breaths. Um, and these ideas are, are not explicit to books I've read or lectures I've seen, um, but are ideas that were shared with me over the course of 20 years of working with folks in long-term solitary confinement. So most notably my elders, Herman Wallace, Albert Wood Fox, and Robert King. Um, and so for context and gratitude, without these three men, I wouldn't have the amazing possibility of speaking with y'all about these ideas. Um, and, um, you know, in, in no uncertain terms, it is through their uh, incredible patience and tutelage and love um, that my own ideas have formed, right? So all of my personal and political orientation is because of the qualities of these men and their tenacity to survive the most deplorable conditions of our uh, collective behavior. So Herman Wallace, Albert Woodfox, and Robert King are collectively known as the Angola Three. Um, it's Herman on your left, King in the center, and Woodfox on the right. For those of you who don't know, Herman Wallace spent 41 years in solitary confinement. That's 41 years in a six by nine foot cell, a minimum of 23 hours a day. King, who's in the center, spent 29 years in isolation, and Fox, who's on the right, spent 44 years in isolation. So 44 years in a six foot by nine foot cell, a minimum of 23 hours a day, collectively known as the Angola Three because um, most of the, that time was spent in Angola prison, which is in Louisiana. So um, for those of you who don't know, again, just grounding and calling us in, if you would know this history, kudos. Um, but I want to make sure we're sort of starting off on the, on the same foot forward. Um, Angola Prison, or the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola, is an 18,000 acre, they call it a former slave plantation. Um, but I would argue that the economic and literal paradigms in which it operates makes it a contemporary plantation, right? 18,000 acres of farmland um, that was first colonized by a man named um, Isaac Franklin um, in the early 1800s. And it is up the Mississippi River, um, about three and a half hours, um, or three if you're in a rush, three and a half hours up the Mississippi, which in early days of colonization um, was predominantly lined by sugarcane plantations, right? The forced chattel practices of, of harvesting sugarcane, which was the bloodiest of all of the chattel crops. So when I talk about chattel crops, I'm talking about indigo, I'm talking about cotton, I'm talking about sugarcane. Um, and tobacco predominantly. And so you can imagine as the Mississippi was lined um, by these chattel crops, um, Louisiana figuratively and literally became fat on the, on the forced labor practices of enslaved bodies predominantly from the continent of Africa. Um, as they were forced to work on unbearable conditions in the heat, which DeWitt and I were talking about of Louisiana, the Southern colonized United States, um, uh, Isaac Franklin realized that folks would have to travel all the way down the treacherous Mississippi River to repopulate their chattel when they pass in the cane fields. I want us to make some connections here between the sugar we consume today and the story. You feel me? So what he decided to do was create a slave breeding plantation on the grounds we now call the Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola, at the Angola Plantation, right? A slave breeding plantation um, uh, which was designed predominantly to repopulate the cane fields. It is named for the place in Africa where he believed the strongest, the biggest, the most profitable chattel came from, the African country of Angola. Um, in 1901, the state of Louisiana um, uh, took ownership of this land. You know, this is a post-reconstruction. 
Jim Crow era, where it became the Louisiana State Penitentiary. As I said, at Angola, uh, today it, ha it houses over 6,000 men that are duly convicted of a so-called crime um, and forced uh, into manual labor practices. So 6,000 men who um, any able-bodied prisoner in, in Angola is forced to work those same 18,000 acres for two to 20 cents an hour, a minimum of 40 hours a week, right? So when I said same economic paradigm as chattel slavery or as a plantation land, um, this is what we're looking at. And so what we saw um, in these forced labor practices or what we're seeing um, in these forced labor practices of today is that the peculiar institution of chattel slavery evolved into the peculiar institution of hyper-incarceration, right? Where those who are duly convicted, justly convicted of a so-called crime, um, uh, uh, except uh, for punishment where crime shall be duly convicted, shall exist in the United States. Sorry, I just blurred that a little bit. So the 13th Amendment, which alleges to abolish slavery, I have to close my eyes for this one, uh, actually legal, legalizes it through an exception where each duly uh, convicted person is forced to work um, for those two to 20 cents an hour. <clears throat> As I said, my presentation, like the last 20 years of my life, will be centered around uh, relationships to punishment, our complicity to punishment, um, where we start to begin to question, to cultivate a sense of curiosity um, within our own responses to crime or notions of justice that celebrate ideas of punishment, revenge, or forced labor. I'm gonna ask us to really think about affecting change in a system written into our consciousness um, as much as our constitution. And as an artist, I think it's really important to ask what role does the imagination play in decarceration or um, abolition? As we look at um, arguably our most condensed um, manifestation of these addictions, this inurement to punishment, solitary confinement, these prison cells that we are building and then holding able-bodied prisoners for a minimum of 23 hours a day, they say 23 and one. Um, and most of my answers come from this uh, unlikely friendship. So in relationship to Herman Wallace, that's a, a young Jackie. Um, and we are in the visiting shed um, inside Angola. Herman, um, as I said, was 41 years in isolation, um, at which you know, he uniquely not only survived, but ascended and transformed and became his own alchemist um, from within the most horrific circumstances. So again, calling on ideas of alchemy and transformation and the imagination. Um, we had the most amazing opportunity to collaborate on a project for over 12 of those um, 41 years called the house that Herman built. Um, and so I spent about 12 years collaborating with Herman to design his dream home from within solitary confinement. I live in Louisiana because of Herman Wallace. Um, and so, you know, 12 years of this man who had been tortured by the state of Louisiana and arguably the complicity of the entire world, kept in isolation, was then visioning his dream home. And so much of that correspondence, at least in the very beginning, um, was maintained um, through the all but forgotten, I would argue, social practice of letter writing. So there was thousands of letters that Herman and I exchanged um, during this process of designing. Um, and they are uh, part of a, an exhibition that is now traveling around the country called Visualizing Abolition, which is the brainchild of Gina Dent and Angela Davis and Rachel Nelson. Um, I'm gonna skip through this because there's a lot, I'm gonna move fast, actually I'm not skipping. Um, but there's a lot on the interwebs about this project that you guys can see there was also a documentary film that was made about it. Um, and if you find this interesting or inspiring or curious, or even if you're like, this sucks and you wanna tear it apart, I encourage you all to Google it um, and then get some more detail in it for the sake of time. Um, but critical to this exhibition was the recreation of Herman's cell from his lived experience. I often talk about it like, you know, I've been uh, playing air guitar with solitary confinement for the last 21 years. And I, I hope to continue playing air guitar for the rest of my life. I don't wanna spend any time in an isolation cell or these modalities of torture. Um, and so, um, so over the course of those 12 years, most of the exhibitions that I created privileged his lived experience through his drawings and conversations, visits to the prison, et cetera. And so in this exhibition, I would juxtapose Herman's reality to the, um, 
superpower of his imagination, of his ability to vision a dream home from within a six by nine cell. Um, and so you can see um, just a couple of installation shots. I can't believe how amazing the resolution is on this projector. And then the way it was notated by Herman's exact handwriting. Um, and so, you know, sometimes I would build out the, a more formal cell where you would have the bed and the toilet sink and the desk and the things to sit on. So people could um, realize that, you know, when someone is in one of these cages, they don't even have that six foot by nine foot space, right? They have, all of that is sort of blocked out by the furniture, which again is all made out of concrete and steel. And I really wanted folks to be able to invest our own imaginations, most of us not having spent time in isolation, um, into the palatable experience that 100,000 men, women, and children at any given moment in our collective history are forced to endure. So again, right now there's 100,000 men, women, and children in the colonized United States, men of the free, home of the brave, however you want to wax it, that are in cages, right? <clears throat> Um, so this cell, the six foot by nine foot cell, became incredibly emotional for me to build. You know, Herman is my cater cousin. He's my elder. He was my beloved. He was my guide. Um, he, again, is the reason that all of this work is able to exist. And so each time um, I would rebuild it, I would feel not only closer to Hooks, sorry, Herman, um, not only closer to Albert, not only closer to King, to Walimu, to Norris, to all of these folks who have meant so much in my uh, unlikely and circuitous path, um, but closer to each one of those 100,000 men, women, and children who are in isolation right now, right? And each time I rebuilt it, it became very clear to me that um, solitary confinement, closed cell restriction, ad seg, the whole, however you wanna call it, um, in, became the most important target for abolition, right? The most concentrated form of our uh, collective ignorance, you might say, or our collective complicity with systems of punishment and control, or we might call the prison industrial complex or the criminal punishment system. And if we assume Angela Davis's perspective um, that prisons are actually isolation within our, our uh, free communities, right? There are very, very uh, few prisons that are actually in the centers of towns, right? I know that, that it, uh, New York State actually has more prisons per capita than any other state in the colonized United States. Um, so you might drive by them, right? But they're not sitting next to you, right? They are isolated from our everyday way of thinking and that's intentional, right? So that kind of isolation for me um, as a modality of punishment is a reflection of how important it is to target extreme isolation as an abolitionist. Um, and I would argue that it is, um, again, the most concentrated uh, part of our socialized addiction to punishment. So as many of you know, after 41 years of solitary confinement and 41 years of a wrongful conviction, 41 years of that six foot by nine foot concrete and steel cell, Herman Mollis's conviction was overturned. He was released on October 1st, 2013. He joined the ancestors on October 4th, 2013. And I want you to pause with that moment, right? and ask as an abolitionist intention, motivated by ideas of abolition, that you try to hold those two tr uh, competing truths at the same time. The absolute miracle that Herman Wallace died free, surrounded by those of us who love the most, innocent in the eyes of the law, right? Miracle. At the same time, you hold the tragedy that he died three days after physical freedom. Right? As abolitionists, what is being asked of us is to strengthen our ability to see the complexity of any given moment of our shared lives, to be able to create space for competing truths at any given moment in our shared lives. Um, <clears throat> you know, I was really lucky because uh, we had all of those letters that I shared with you at the very beginning, hundreds of thousands of letters that Herman and I had shared. And so in my uh, confounding grief, I was able to revisit those letters again and again. And you know, I don't know if anyone's lost anyone near or dear to them, but when you do, the whole world is different, right? So those letters are part of the whole world and they were really different. And so I started to see how much this man um, talked about flowers and talked about wood and talked about trees and talked about the natural world, you know? In fact, when I asked them, what kind of house does a man who's lived in a six foot by nine foot cell, then 29 years, dream of? He said, I can clearly see the gardens 
and they will be full of vaccinias, delphiniums, and roses. And I wish for guests to be able to smile and walk through flowers all year round. So think about that, right? To be tortured by concrete and steel. And the first thing you're connected to are the flowers, right? The gardens. The wish for others to be able to walk through gardens and smile all year round. That is revolutionary, yeah. Um, so Herman Wallace was a Black Panther political prisoner, as was Herman Wallace and Albert Woodfox, excuse me, and Robert King and Woodfox. And the second thing he asked for was a swimming pool with a light green bottom with a large Black Panther in the center. Um, so again, disoriented by the grief of losing Herman, when I went back and revisited the treasure of those letters, and noticed how much he talked about gardens. I knew there was a, a way to uphold the life and legacy of such a remarkable man through gardening. But as a builder, you know, I have a social practice, um, but I like to make things a lot. I had never gardened in my whole life, but I knew there was some way that Herman needed to be upheld by what uh, the natural world offered us. And I was visiting a homie's um, garden in New Orleans called Rodat, which you probably know. And he was showing me some of the early stages of the gardens. And I was like, oh shit, that's about the same, same size as Herman's cell. And then it was just like download after download. So since 2015, with the intention of upholding Herman's life and legacy and continuing to illustrate the inhumanity of solitary confinement, right? Arguably, you could say these two competing truths, the worst of our humanity and Herman, the best of our humanity. At the same time, I started a project called the Solitary Gardens, which takes that same cell, that six foot by nine foot cell as a cross section and then builds garden beds. And these garden beds are co-created by folks who are still in isolation, folks who are still incarcerated and volunteers like any one of us in this room to grow the gardens that they themselves design. So you can see they maintain the same size and blueprint as an isolation cell that's six by nine. And the only place that the human being can grow is where they can physically move. So in that negative space. Um, I like to think about these gardens as principled on the tenets of uh, PIC abolition, permaculture and social practice, right? They're at this intersection that has been critical to the way I negotiate the world over the last 20 so years. Um, and again, through that social practice of letter writing, we share growing almanacs and photographs and written exchanges. Sometimes folks um, visit um, the solitary gardeners inside, but we begin to translate their imaginations into the ground, um, growing the plants and vegetables and herbs of their choosing. So just moving through a little faster, but you could see it's um, through this letter writing that um, we start to build the gardens of folks' dreams. And in a lot of ways, these gardens then become portraits of folks who are condemned to the worst of our humanity. Um, those buried deepest inside our institutions of punishment and control, or as Marian Kaba says, our institutions of, of death, yeah? Um, as I said, prison abolition is written into the tenants of solitary gardens, it is foundational. And so over time, we will see these prison cells turn garden beds overcome with plant life. Over time, we will see them disappear, right? And in the same way that we start to think about ideas of implicit bias that has informed so much of the ways that America's um, imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist, heteropatriarchy um, exists. In that same way, I'm hoping to tap into this bias that maybe if we see these prison cells turn garden beds disappear, we will start to believe that is actually possible. <clears throat> um, natural materials in the natural world are of course critical to the pieces of storytelling. You can see in the background, um, I'm growing sugarcane on site uh, behind Victoria. Um, and then on the right, there's pictures of some cotton. Um, so uh, critical to some of the poetics of this project, um, these garden beds are made from the ancestral byproducts of those largest chattel slave crops. So um, sugarcane, cotton, and tobacco. Um, and then we're mixing that with a non-hydraulic lime to create a revolutionary mortar. So the idea is to illustrate the evolution of chattel slavery into mass incarceration by building um, these prison cells turn garden beds out of those largest chattel crops. Um, and what becomes really remarkable is that we're working with these materials which are hard labor. 
which is voluntary hard labor. And then what it does is very naturally bring up conversations of what it means to be doing it as forced labor practices. But then working within the constitution of transformation and alchemy to create a completely different and arguably holistic outcome. You can see here, this is one of the solitary gardens in its early stages, nascent stages that is growing. Um, you can see the delineation of that toilet sink, the bed to the right, the desk, um, and the bench. Um, but because they are natural materials, they change over time, like all of us, right? The only constant in our lives is change. And so as they change, we're asking the same question that I ask as an abolitionist. What happens if we invest in possibility? Right? Instead of trying to uh, keep them together as a, a certain kind of identity, the rigidity of identity that the PIC employs on folks for arguably the worst mistake of their lives. This idea that they might be condemned um, to the crime that may, they may or may not have committed, right? They're condemned to a DOC number reduced to prisoner 76759, and then held within that space for the duration oftentimes of their natural lives. And what happens if we change that and we start to invest in the possibility of the human being or the human doing who may or may not have committed egregious harm. And we answer that through the gardens. So as they change, we're working with the solitary gardeners and sometimes they become butterflies. Sometimes they become caduceuses. I don't know if that's the right plural, but um, whatever they might vision. And I can share with you pictures of the gardens that um, solitary gardeners have changed towards the end of the presentation. But just to say, this became the placeholder for a project um, that I was able to take on the road um, to then install in, in two dozen or so places around the country um, with the hope of, of bringing up these questions and curiosity around abolition. So getting people to be like, what is this? Why is this garden bed looking a whole lot like a, cell, like a prison cell? And then to engage with those questions with a sense of wonder rather than the rigidity of knowing. And I had um, the great pleasure of doing that with uh, someone who had spent five years in isolation. This is Rodriguez Crawford. So again, this idea that, um, you know, the lived experience of solitary is, is, um, is much different than the being within sol being in proximity to solitary confinement for 20 or so years. So Rod and I traveled up and down the East Coast um, in 2018 with support from a blade of grass. I had retrofitted this ambulance. You could see on the left, actually, there's a, some more pictures of it, but an old ambulance to become an abolitionist vehicle called the Garrison, which is a, a nod to William Lloyd Garrison, but also this idea that we would rock up and station troops, station ideas, abolitionist ideas and principles. And then we built solitary gardens in Philly and Providence, um, in Houston, in a reclaimed youth facility in North Carolina. Um, many universities, this is Xavier University and uh, the Lower East Side Girls Club in New York City. Um, and then in the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center um, in Connecticut. And what I think is really beautiful is that each one of these solitary gardens, like we just rocked up and built them in collaboration with the community. And then each one could take on their own interpretation, right? So for instance, this is the one at the Harriet Beecher Stowe Center. And so what they did is they planted it um, with all of, the, um, all of the plants that are mentioned in Uncle Tom's cabin, which is so sweet. Um, the one that was in Providence was grown with the first woman to transition um, inside a maximum male penal institution in the state of Rhode Island. And she knew she was coming home in April. And so when she came home, Deja, she um, then grew her garden with one of her sisters who was still locked up inside. So the idea that, oops, I'm sorry, we get to build these together and then they become like little baby Herman's houses. Right? They become uh, about the relationships that y'all cultivate with the incarcerated person. And really, for me, the hope is that they inspire you to transcend the human constructs of the, the prison industrial complex. Right? All the ways that we've been kept outside, we become um, uh, visionaries in how to, how to transcend that. So um, the next project I'll talk about uh, is organized around ADX. So 
you know, we have more people incarcerated just making sure we know. I'm sorry, Doug, did I mess up? No, um, We have more people incarcerated in the colonized United States than any place in the world. New Orleans, Louisiana is the incarceration capital of the United States, right? So there's approximately 2.3 million folks who are incarcerated in the US, 8 million folks under some form of correctional control, probation, parole, incarceration, detention. 13 million people, human beings, human doings like you and I, that are moving through prisons, jails, and detention centers, moving through some form of the criminal punishment system every single day of our lives, right? So um, the worst of these conditions is ADX, um, which is also called the Alcatraz of the, Rock, uh, the Rockies. It's in Florence, Colorado. Um, show of hands, if I could take a sip of this water. How many people have heard of ADX before? Kind of, sort of. Okay, well, ADX um, is the place uh, that the federal government built to send the so-called worst of the worst. So your Musayah Zakharawis, your El Chapos, your domestic terrorists, um, Ted Kaczynski, um, all, all of the sort of more named, more familiar names that we might have in terms of harm that has been committed. Um, but if they build it, they will fill it, right? So you also end up with folks who have committed arguably nonviolent crimes in ADX who may have posed an escape risk or may have gotten into a fight in their carceral institution who then get moved there. Um, 80% of ADX is underground. So 80% of the physical constructs of this prison are, are below the sight line, which means there are no circadian rhythms. There's no sunrise, there's no sunset. And folks are going crazy, right? It is, it is explicitly designed to torture human beings. It's like, like crazy to think that way, that there are architects that are dreaming and scheming of the worst thing that they could do to another person, right? And then they build it. The federal government in the United States build it. And so what is our involvement in this? How are we complicit in the constructs of these death camps? <clears throat> and then as a result, how do we spin that? How do we transform that and say that our complicity is also our superpower, right? Because we are involved in building it, we can be involved in deconstructing it, right? PIC abolition is actually possible. It is possible to live in a landscape without prisons. Um, one of the solitary gardeners that I worked with for about five years is Jesse, and he's been at ADX um, a little over seven years. Um, I, I have been asked not to share his last name for his own protection. But Jesse um, was in a federal prison in Mississippi. Um, some shit went down. Jesse got into a, a, a fight with another prisoner and then was transferred to ADX where he's been, as I said, for the last eight years. And so I got to know this prison <clears throat> through Jesse's eyes and Jesse's lived experience. Um, and again, if, you know, my target is the most concentrated form of torture, the most concentrated form of punishment, this is a, a critical to the story of solitary confinement. And so um, through Jesse's drawings, I created um, a greenhouse. Jesse's drawings and uh, reflections that I was able to find on the internet. Um, a greenhouse uh, that is the same size and blueprint as the isolation cell. So taking something that is invisible to us um, and buried from our consciousness and our, and our literal sight, and then making it completely transparent. So we can again, engage with um, the, the notions of torture. Um, you can see here the greenhouse itself has all of these flowers that are growing around it. And as a, a social practice, I worked with um, a class at the University of Michigan. Ooh, that was a big fuck up at um, Michigan State University, the University of Michigan's rival um, to create curriculum, a seed curriculum um, that told the story of incarceration, that told the story of isolation, so talking about ideas of solitary confinement, and told the story of migration um, through the plants themselves. So we created this um, seed curriculum together and then planted those oops, plants around the uh, outside of Jesse's greenhouse. 
Um, and so I just want to name that for me, it's really important not just to have the big bold projects that travel around the whole world and get all this attention, but to have these micro moments as part of an emergent strategy. And to remember that the, the seed is arguably the most powerful part of the plant, right? Like that all of the energy of the plant goes towards making the seeds. And they have all of these incredible strategies to grow these seeds um, into the next generation of plants. And that's really how I see myself as, a, as an evolutionist and as an artist. It's like, what are the different ways that I can make all of these seeds that get you uncomfortable a little bit, but also curious, right? That make you wanna know a little bit more about PIC evolution. What is this lady talking about, right? How is this actually possible? What else can we do to create a more humane and equitable world for each other on behalf of all living bees, you know? Um, What's really nice, I'm psyched about this, so I, I put this, uh, these slides into the presentation, is that um, the Jesse's, um, Jesse's greenhouse is actually gonna go to PS1, MoMA in New York um, in the fall, which is dope, um, because it's a wider audience. You know, In a lot of ways, these works become like Trojan horses. You know, I met Herman in 2001, so this is before Michelle Alexander's book before we were sort of talking about mass incarceration on a national level, right? Before we thought, oh shit, there's something wrong. We have more people incarcerated than any place in the world. This doesn't feel right. Most of us, right? Of course, my elders were very much aware of this, but most of us were, most of you probably weren't even born yet, but you know what I mean? This is like most of the colonized the United States wasn't talking about it in the level that we're talking about it now. And so Herman's house became this kind of Trojan horse that was all, all these fancy museums and all these spaces and engaging with folks who maybe aren't forced by proximity, right? Who aren't next to, whose beloveds are not incarcerated um, to start thinking about it and to start thinking about the ways that they are actually complicit in it. And so having this at PS1 MoMA is an even bigger platform. And what's nice is that what we're gonna do is create an altar to abolition that is collectively grown um, and collectively built. So again, seeding some ideas with y'all and the ways that you vision and dream to see if there might be a way that you'd be interested in plugging in. And then um, another component of this, like you could see this looks a lot like a, um, a prison yard these large, large, large walls um, that you can't see over, you can't really hear what's on the other side, that's intentional, but there's these tiny holes that are um, uh, placed within the concrete walls as a way to, it was explained to me that um, it's a way to allow wind to move through them so they don't tumble. And so um, for this exhibition, we're gonna be training, I'm working with the Lower East Side Girls Club again. So we're training the plants to escape through the holes, um, the architectural holes. Um, so we're, we're talking about liberation, literally and figuratively, um, through the training of these plants to transcend and escape. Um, and, um, and the sort of loose title is land, escaping instead of landscaping. How are we doing on time? It's 517. We're okay? Okay. Um, so you can see that, you know, incidentally, accidentally, through the laws of the universe, I somehow ended up working with gardens um, since 2015. Um, which, I, you know, is again, the best way I can imagine upholding the life and legacy of Herman. Um, and so I've learned very much to follow the laws of nature as an ethos um, and as a practice, and that so many of the solutions to the crises that we as humans have created on the planet, be it the climate crisis, be it mass incarceration, environmental racism, sexism, on and on and on, um, the solutions to these crises can be found within the stories that plants tell us, including the work of abolition. Um, and so, you know, it's really through practices of listening that the next few projects, these outgrowths of the solitary gardens have um, been born into existence. Um, so here we are, 2022, there's over two dozen solitary gardens around the country. There's 10 in New Orleans. Um, and, um, you know, that means that we're growing a whole bunch of stuff. And one of the big questions that I get asked is like, well, what do you do with it? You know, 
And sometimes the volunteers that are working with solitary gardeners will take the stuff home, they cook it, and then they share the pictures with the gardeners, whatever it might be. It's a really beautiful part of the exchange. Um, sometimes this is the family of one of the solitary gardeners that came and harvested from his garden. But then I still, you know, have so much um, plant matter, plant material left over. And so in 2018, I started um, experimenting and making plant medicine from all of the uh, plants that were left over in the solitary gardens, just tinkering, just being curious, just cultivating with a sense of wonder. Um, and then out of that came this beautiful project um, called the Prisoner's Apothecary. And the Prisoner's Apothecary um, has now grown into a collaboration with a community herb school where folks that are going through that herb school become pen pals with folks who are incarcerated. And then in doing so, they begin to design um, the medicine that is planted inside the solitary gardens. And then we take that plant medicine um, and create an entire apothecary. Um, and then um, that apothecary is then offered out to communities that are directly impacted by the far reach of mass incarceration through mutual aid events <clears throat> and other initiatives. But what I want to center is the idea that, you know, we have created an entire um, apothecary of plant medicine grown in collaboration and designed by folks who are still incarcerated. And in this way, you know, um, we're asking incarcerated individuals um, or providing a unique opportunity for many of them to heal the communities that they are often accused of harming, right? So we're really trying to transcend you know, the collective perceptions of criminality, human value, restitution, and redemption. Um, again, as I said, you know, this apothecary has many different manifestations um, through these various mutual aid events, which came in really became critical to um, post Ida. We had a big ass hurricane in October of this year. The October or September? Do you remember? September, yeah. Oh no, it's on the anniversary of Katrina, so it's the last day of August. Uh, um, and so um, we really activated the prisoner's apothecary to offer mutual aid um, through plant medicine, teas, tinctures, salves, et cetera, to folks, many of us who are without power, um, gas, um, or electric for uh, two weeks. Um, also, you know, sending out packages during the uprisings, the racial justice uprisings, the fires in California. Um, and again, this plant medicine is designed by folks who we, most of us, have, have decided are not valuable to our community. Um, I'll be taking this project on the road uh, through Creative Capital, um, which, Margareta, maybe we could talk about stopping up here. I will be going up to Vermont. Um, but the idea is that um, uh, the Prisoner's Apothecary will offer these healing justice workshops that ultimately will illustrate important connections between PIC abolition and the natural world. Um, the workshops themselves, similar to the abolitionist tea party, will show us how plants um, ultimately teach us to be better people. Um, not only learning about the local plants and plant medicine, but we'll ask um, how does the natural world endorse abolition as a strategy both for survival and for joy. Um, and hopefully some of you will get a, a taste of this on Saturday. I just threw this slide in there, probably some misspellings, but please tell me if this is right. Cool. And they do they sign up, Margareta, or do they just rock up? Okay, cool. Um, so again, thinking about the emergent strategies that plants employ, you know, from small to large, um, I designed this project called the Apothecarts. Um, and the apothecarts, similar to the van, but smaller, are bike pulled carts um, that rock up through New Orleans. These, this is a collaboration with um, Tulane School of Architecture. Um, and, and the um, emblem, the logo for this is um, a Biden's plant. It's called Biden's Pilosa, which is similar to y'all's um, dandelions. So it's this plant that just pops up all over Louisiana, um, all over New Orleans. And so many people think of it as a weed, just a weed, right? Similar to dandelions. 
And similar to dandelions, Biden's pilosa has so much medicine and so much potential um, to heal us. It's an incredible, um, uh, incredible plant medicine for stagnation. So to get your lymph nodes moving, to get your bloodstream moving. Um, and, uh, and I personally uh, had been bitten by a wolf spider in 2020, which turned into this like crazy infection um, and, and staph infection that became MRSA and all of these other horrific things. And they were gonna hospitalize me. And then um, I reached out to my herbalist friend because you know this is like pre-vaccine, shit's crazy. I don't want to be in a hospital. Nobody does. COVID's you know really consuming so many folks in my community. And um, and she said try Biden's wherever you can, like Biden's tincture, Biden's tea, Biden's raw from the ground. And within 48 hours, um, the infection in my arm started to clear up. Isn't that amazing? from a little weed. Um, and so what I really think is important is illustrating that, you know, the, the parallels, um, not only in metaphor, but the literal experience of, of our um, quickness to reject something as just a weed. And that means we need to get rid of it. We need to eradicate it. Um, we need to quarantine it, right? And yet it has all of this value if we are willing to exercise our ability to see complexity in the same way we do that to human beings, right? Oh, this person has caused harm. This person has hurt somebody else. This person has committed a crime. That is their only value. And what happens if we actually unpack that and see how much, um, how much they, he, she, they can contribute to our society? Okay. So the biggest project that I'm working on now, we met the apothecarts and the apothecary, um, kind of the way I think of it, this is the big forest, um, is the Prisoner's Apothec Cafe. So I've been working over the last year or so, um, valued on the principles of abolition and mutual aid as an antidote to racial capitalism and white male bodied supremacy um, to create this diversion program and cafe um, that it, at the center of it are these practices and tenets of abolition. And so we'll be growing plants um, similar to solitary gardens in collaboration with folks who are still inside. And then as a practice, um, or, or as a diversion program, sorry, um, creating a, a holistic abolitionist garden and diversion program with our first ever progressive DA, Jason Williams. Um, so it's real time practical abolition um, in praxis and practice. Um, to, to remind us that abolition is not a, a destination per se, right? It's not a place you land and you're like, you know, well, I did a restorative justice circle, therefore I'm an abolitionist, but it's an ongoing constant process of changing, reorienting ourselves, checking in with the way that we're thinking, the way that we respond to micro and macro aggressions, right? I think of abolition more as a philosophy than a destination. Um, and along the way, we have all these beautiful stops. Um, this is the abolition for the people garden. So this is uh, central to the abolitionist cafe. And we just did this dope ass workshop where um, we looked at the different ways that we could build structures within the garden using existing materials, right? To metabolize or alchemize, to transform so many things that are already around us. Um, as an abolitionist pr practice, right? So to take clay that we had dug up from the land, um, to take sand, again, dug up from the land, uh, river sand, um, and then Spanish moss from the trees of New Orleans, which you know, is considered an invasive species, and then together collaborate, collaboratively transform it to build um, fences or to cover the existing fences which, oops, sorry again. I would argue, um, you know, that these metal fences within them contain uh, the architecture of oppression. So to say we can and should and will do something different. And so as we transmute and remix and alchemize as, a, as an abolitionist practice, I want us to really be thinking about um, all the different ways that we can begin to see the obstacles in our lives as opportunities um, and to ask how do we begin to end our, our suffering, our individual suffering and our collective suffering. For me, um, the first step of becoming an abolitionist is really strengthening and exercising 
our commitments um, to creativity and to the imagination. I often say, you know, that I, the first target of the oppressor is the imagination. If they get that, they get us, right? So how do we really strengthen that as alchemists, as artists, as recyclers, as creators? And then combine that with a sense of wonder and curiosity. How do we interrogate these systems that they've told us will solve um, our social problems, right? If, if the United States, if, if punishment were um, actually able to deter crime, then the United States would be the safest country in the world, arguably, right? Because we have more people incarcerated than any place else. Is it? Fuck no, right? So we've given that 400 years or more of opportunity to see if it works and it doesn't. So how do we, particularly the young people in the room, how do you begin to imagine um, a different landscape that doesn't rely on punishment to solve our crises? <clears throat> and so I think there are a number of different ways that we can imagine, reimagine the world that we live in, coming back to that very first slide. Um, and for me, I'll finish here um, with a, a poem from Rumi. Through love, disaster becomes good fortune. Through love, a prison becomes a garden. Thank you so very much for enduring this talk. This here is our, we, we've got a program. This is a land trust property, a local land trust. Okay. And what we've been doing is work, we have over the last 13 years now, is work with the Central School. We call it a, the fifth grade ecology project. And what we come out here three times a year and in the spring, we come and plant trees. So they, these are 12 year, 13 year old trees here. And then these younger ones, as you go down the slope, they're smaller. I'm kind of running out of space. But what I do is I come in and cut out the honeysuckle, create space for planting. And there's a new one right there. Uh, but anyway, this is the fifth grade forest here. That's, we're going to get a sign eventually. There's red pine and white pine and white spruce and Norway spruce and red oak, red pine. Tamarack. Uh, there's a lot of a um, couple of different species. The deer are really a challenge. They don't really like this tree, but you can see they've been chewing on it. Yeah. They, they'll bite into this. You know, you, it's surprising given how coarse it is. That is. I thought that. Um, okay, good. I mean, I think you know, or maybe started from here. But I don't. I mean, it's kind of suckery, but yeah. it seems like it would be good. And this, well, this has got a few moves, but this is good. Some of this stuff, you I'll, know. Like I don't know if I would take it because it's the tree is still. But like, if you were gonna cut this to sort of force out the growth a little bit yeah, more. Yeah. Then you could take that and then all the little ones going up that branch. You well, okay, I mean? why don't you, why don't you, uh... Like, if it makes sense to sort of cut it, to push it out, yeah. then, then this would be a good... And that would make it more accessible, too, mm -hmm. to, 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 uh, to working it, working yeah. on it, so you don't need a ladder or something. Okay, why don't we prune this right now? Okay. As a demo. You, you point stuff out and I'll do it. Well, let's do, let's do that. Start with that one? Yeah. not to touch the this part okay That's good. Okay. Yeah, it's a little knobby, but why not? Okay. 
So what we've been doing here is attempting to reclaim a lot. This was a pasture in the 1970s. So there's a, there were cattle on here, and, it's, and they kept it open. And then when they took the cattle off in the 80s, 90s, somewhere around there, it started to grow up to this. This is what it looked, the whole property looked like. You know, this. And slowly, over the last 20 years, we've been reclaiming some of the open land. And instead of using cattle, we have um, a guy, somebody comes in with a big heavy-duty tractor and cuts down the brush. And, or we do every three to four years, we cut it down. He just did it in October. This section here, students from Marsville College come uh, in their invasive species class. They come up here every April and they've been hacking away at the honey. It's primarily honeysuckle and buckthorn. We're retaining the native shrubs and apples and hawthorn and some of these ash trees. But the idea is to, to really, for one, to make it accessible. It's in, almost impossible to walk through that. Uh, where once you, you have it open, it cre it's, a little, it's more interesting, it's more diverse, and it's more accessible. Yeah. I see there's another apple right in there. Uh, so this, what we're doing here is, again, trying to get rid of the hawthorn, uh, not the hawthorn, the, the honeysuckle, mm -hmm. and create, uh, kind of reclaim the, the, the forest here by planting. This, this, these are sycamore trees. The, the fifth grade planted this one. I got a little tag. This might be a way to do it too. I don't know if yeah. that, I laminated these little tags. But um, uh, sycamore is what's called a riparian tree. You know, it's a, sea, uh, a, a creekside tree. That's where you'd see them um, in undeveloped conditions. But we've got a bunch of them here. We've got this one, this one we just planted. But I, these were seedlings that I planted. These were a little larger, but all throughout here, and then for the rest of the property, it's more mature forest. As you go down, there's, the whole property is 17 acres. And what we just walked through is kind of that transition, agricultural land. But this is, you know, 100 year old forest down that way. And this is really kind of transitions right at this point from a wetland into a stream channel. And then as you go down, it turns into a gorge, you know, exposed geology, you know, the shale rock, and it really is, um, it, it really tr changes over the course, of, you know, this, this small, even on this small property, it's a, quite a transition from, uh, from just a kind of a s steady wetland to a small cascading waterfalls. It's, it's kind of nice. Yeah. yeah, I would like to go look at the Wixon uh, That's, that's a uh, raspberry, really? wild raspberry, yeah. It's beautiful. It's, that beautiful. Yeah, that, that color is really nice, isn't it? Hi, my name is Oliver Kelhammer, and I'm an artist. And one of my hobbies is grafting. What's grafting? Grafting is attaching two different kinds of plants, uh, trees together, uh, using a very uh, simple technique, kind of like micro carpentry. And if you do it successfully, the uh, tree that you're grafting to will join to the twig that you've uh, stuck onto it. So that's what grafting is. And grafting is very useful because if you are, are living in a cold climate and you have a type of tree that's very adapted to cold, but you wanna grow a more tender type of tree, like a, a fruit that's more tender, you can graft the twig from the tender tree to the root of the hardy tree. This has been done for thousands of years by people who grow fruit trees. So uh, we're gonna learn about how to do that today, but first a little terminology. The uh, bottom part, the tree that's growing in the ground is called the root stock for obvious reasons. It's the root that's in the ground. And the twig that you're using to graft to the root is called the scion. S-C-I-O-N, or cyan wood. So I'm going to demonstrate two types of grafting today. The first called the uh, wedge graft, and the second called the whip and tongue graft. And both of these grafts, uh, when they work, will uh, form a stable union, which will allow 
the root to feed the twig, i.e. the rootstock to feed the cyan wood. And uh, if you do it right, you'll get uh, a tender fruit on a cold, hardy root. So let me show you uh, what they will look like when they're finished, and then we'll actually get into the grafting procedure. So uh, this is a finished wedged graft. So this had grown successfully. Uh, the tree died for other reasons, uh, but uh, the bottom part of the wedge graft, the rootstock has a slot, just a slot that I cut with a knife. And the top, the twig, the cyan that was grafted in was just uh, whittled or carved into a simple wedge and shoved into that slot. That was bandaged up and allowed to heal, and then it formed this stable graft union. All right, the next one that I'm going to demonstrate is called the whip and tongue graft. Now, the whip and tongue, it sounds very kind of racy, but it's a, a very simple graft and a very stable graft. So in the whip and tongue, the uh, cyan and the rootstock both have the same uh, cut. It's uh, basically a diagonal cut with a little slot, which creates this thing called the tongue that allows the two pieces to join together. So this was a plum uh, and uh, two kinds of plum tree and the bottom and the top joined uh, successfully together to form this a uh, whip and tongue union. So this one is also very, very useful. And um, uh, if you know these two kinds of graphs, you can pretty much tackle any kind of uh, grafting uh, that you're likely to encounter. There, there are many variations, but basically this is the first uh, principle. Hi, so before we start grafting in earnest, I, I need to tell you about the tools that you should have. So uh, it's really good to have a nice sharp pair of pruning shears or secateurs as they're called. Uh, uh, the sharper, the better. Uh, you can do a lot of the work with just the pruning shears. So uh, get yourself a good pair. Uh, these happen to be Felco pretty shears, but you can get some good uh, knockoffs uh, that are uh, almost as good. And so make sure they're good and sharp. So pruning shears is one thing that you'll need. The next thing that you'll need is some kind of knife. Now, you can use an X-Acto knife, but this is a special Swiss grafting knife. And when I undo the knife you'll see that it has a very sharp blade and it's sort of uh, angled to one side. So it makes uh, slicing the wedge grafts quite, quite good. And it um, uh, also has a other blade in here with a little uh, fin on the back of it or a tang. And we're not gonna use that today, but that's for bud grafting. And what that does is it lifts the, um, let me just see if I can open this. Um, it lifts the bark for a different kind of graft. Uh, so there's the, it's called the bud knife. Um, so these, these are not particularly expensive, uh, but any knife will do as long as it's very, very sharp. So I suggest an X-Acto knife or an Olfa knife or something uh, because they're quite, quite sharp. Uh, but if you're lucky enough to have a grafting knife or you wanna uh, invest in one, they're not that expensive. Uh, these, these are great. They'll last you, you know, if you don't lose it for, the rest of your life. And the third thing that you need is, or actually there's four things, the third thing that you need is some sort of grafting tape. Okay, this is a commercial grafting tape, which is clear. You can use a plastic bag cut up, that works fine. Some people use uh, biodegradable rubber bands, which can be purchased online, or you can just use a regular rubber band some people use bicycle inner tubes cut up. Those seem to work quite well. 
but this is the bandage that will hold the two parts of the tree together. So grafting tape of some sort, uh, uh, the commonest thing is a plastic bag cut up, but you will have to remember to take that off when the graft is joined. And the fourth thing is very handy. It's not required, but highly recommended, is a thick glove. Now, the reason that um, I'm gonna wear this glove is when you're doing grafting, you quite often have to cut towards yourself. And as your mom always told you, do not cut towards yourself because you could hurt yourself. Unfortunately, with grafting, it's hard not to do that. So protecting the hand that's holding the graft uh, with some sort of heavy duty glove will save you a lot of band-aids. Um, and that said, uh, if you're gonna be doing a lot of that, having a, a first aid kit on hand is probably not a bad idea either, but a good glove for the hand that's holding the work is uh, highly recommended by me. Okay, and then we're gonna, after this quick uh, pause, we're gonna um, go into the next how to do the actual graft. Hi everyone, so we're gonna uh, demonstrate a wedge graft. So this will be the rootstock. So imagine this, uh, which is a crab apple, is growing in the ground, okay? And I'm out in the orchard or the garden or uh, the, you know, vacant lot. I found this tree growing in the ground and I wanna graft a wonderful edible apple to it. Uh, so the first thing is I look at this and it looks healthy, which is good. So I am going to uh, just trim the tree a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna cut the top off uh, so that it can work. I don't want too many side branches in the way, so I'm just gonna cut it right about here. So you can see that this tree is quite uh, healthy. Now I'm gonna turn it towards you and you will see if the camera picks it up, a layer of bark and a layer of green, a green kind of ring, that is called the cambium or cambium, depending on uh, what kind of uh, vowels you like to use. But the cambium is the living part of the tree that uh, exchanges the nutrients from the roots to the leaves. And that is the part that is gonna be doing the joining. It's gonna, the part that's the living tissue that, that will join to um, the cyan wood. So you wanna make sure you know what cambium is and try to identify it on the uh, uh, tree that you're actually working with. So that's cambium there. So what I'm now gonna do is cut a slot. Now, the two ways of doing it you can use a pruning shear. Uh, I'm gonna use a knife. And the thing to do is with the knife, let the knife do the work. So you can see how you're cutting towards the other hand here. You wanna just not force it. You just wanna slowly rock the knife back and forth. Now you'll find that some wood, like the crab apple here, is very hard. And so this may be a bit of work, which is where a sharp knife comes in. And you want to very slowly make the slot, let the knife work its way down and uh, try not to cut yourself. And don't be impatient. So you can see the knife is slowly working its way. Now some trees it's much quicker because it's um, softer wood, but this is very, very hard wood. So, so now you can see that my knife has gone quite far in. That should be about enough. So now I am going to get the sign wood. So let's just pretend this is growing. Uh, we'll get back to it. Um, then the sign wood. All right. So let's call this the sign wood. So you can actually find this sign wood if you are finding an abandoned orchard that you may have. Uh, knowledge that there's some really good fruit in there, or people trade cyan wood uh, at cyan wood uh, swaps, uh, people who are like into fruit. Uh, so collecting cyan wood is something you should be doing in the late winter, and you can store cyan wood, which is basically these twigs, in the fridge uh, wrapped in like wet paper towel so it doesn't dry out, and you can keep it dormant. So the key with this really is to have your cyan wood dormant meaning that it's not budding out. And the rootstock should be just about waking up. So the good time to do this is sort of like, you know, late March, early April in many kind of places in the temperate zone. So the sap is starting to come up from the rootstock while the 
cyan is still asleep. So we're going to do a wedge graft here. So we are actually going to cut, I'm going to trim some of these side branches off. Now, if you're really too cool for school, you can do this with um, a pruning shear, but that will sometimes create a messy uh, uh, cut. So the best way really is to use your grafting knife. So cut a long angle or what's called a um, oblique angle, meaning very, very gradual angle. And the more oblique, the better because it will create a uh, more surface area for the graft to join. And you can see here, the cambium is just along the edge, and that's gonna be the part you're gonna to wanna to join to the rootstock. Now you're gonna do the same thing on the other side, a long angle. And again, take your time. Uh, the knife will do the work. Pushing the knife is always a bad idea. So here we go, that's not too bad, but you may wanna make it more pointy. Uh, so I'm gonna do that. A couple uh, more shavings here. There's, that's pretty good there. So get rid of any excess like this, and that's not too bad. So now I'm gonna go back to my rootstock. So remember, this is growing in the ground, and I'm gonna push this in here. Now, sometimes it helps to use the grafting knife to open up the uh, slot so that you can get this started. So we're gonna do that because this is quite springy. Oh, thank you, my uh, camera person is holding the tree because ordinarily there'd be roots holding it. So we have an assistant. All right, so now I'm gonna push this in, but the important part here is that the cambium aligns on one side. So generally speaking, unless you're very lucky, the cambium uh, will only align on one side because the twig, i.e. the cyan, will not necessarily be the same diameter as the diameter of the rootstock. So you kind of have to decide which is your best fit, right? Because it's always going to be a little better on one side of the wedge than the other. So this isn't looking too bad. What you want is not much airspace uh, between the, in fact, you want no airspace, so you want to wiggle it around a bit so that it fits very, very tightly. And don't be afraid to shave it uh, a little bit if it's not fitting well. So this one, I'll maybe just shave a little more. It's not terrible, but you want it to, uh, to fit quite well because it's the cambial contact that will uh, allow the cells to... Um, to start to join. Uh, and if there's air in there, they won't, they'll just uh, scar over. So this isn't terrible. That's fitting pretty well, but it could be better. Yeah, that's gonna work. Okay, so you see it's quite tight um, on the uh, on the sides there, okay? So that is a wedge graft. Now, in order to make this not dry out, it's like if you've, this is surgery, we've just done tree surgery, right? So you want a Band-Aid after surgery. So we are gonna wrap this with some grafting tape. So what I'm gonna do is cut a little piece of tape. I just have some scissors here, but often you can just cut it with a knife. Uh, depending on the tape, uh, you, may you might wanna have pre-cut strips so now I'm going to wrap this around the graft union. And we're doing this for the sake of the camera, so it's a little awkward. And you want to have it good and tight. And what's going to happen here is this is going to keep out the uh, um, pests and also keep in the moisture so that the graft union will um, join and then you're going to want to tie the end off. Now, depending on the tape, sometimes it's pretty stretchy, which this is. So I'm going to tie this off. I'm going to take my glove off because it's too hard to tie a knot with a glove on. And uh, since my fingers are out of danger for the moment, um, so let's just do that. Uh, if you can just hold this, that'd be great. Thank you. 
This is the hardest part for me. I can do the grafting, but the tying and knots, uh, not having been a Boy Scout, is always like a big challenge. Um, there we go. Good. So there is your completed whip, uh, sorry, uh, wedge graft. This is a completed wedge graft. And uh, I would actually add a little more tape here because the uh, slot is going a little further. I would actually tape that up some more, but for the purposes of demonstration, uh, that's the basic principle. Um, and if I was gonna tape it up more, I would definitely uh, remove these little side uh, spurs here and uh, add some more tape. But that's the principle, that's a wedge graft. And uh, that should grow. So within, uh, if I was doing this, you know, at the end of March, I should start to see some activity in the sign wood, uh, you know, maybe by early May, it should start to leaf out and I should be able to tell whether it's connected or not, the graft has joined. And then uh, if it has, then I will come along and remove this plastic because it will, uh, you know, ultimately strangle the tree if it's left on there. Uh, but there are biodegradable uh, options as well uh, that, that can be left on. But if you're using any kind of plastic, uh, definitely remove it once the graft is, has taken. Okay, so that is a wedge graft. Hi there. So this is the second type of graft we're going to be doing today. This is the infamous whip and tongue graft, which sounds a lot more complicated than it is. Once again, I have my rootstock, so this would be the tree that's growing in the ground, the hardy rootstock. And instead of uh, cutting a simple wedge, we're going to do something a little more fancy, but we're basically going to be doing the same thing uh, for both the rootstock and the cyan wood. So the first thing you want to do is cut a very oblique angle. So we're going to do this with the, the pruning shears, and I might need to clean it up a bit with the grafting knife. Oh, there goes um, the uh, piece of wood flying. Uh, and we're gonna do the same thing with the uh, uh, cyan wood, which is here. So let me just uh, demonstrate that again. The same thing, a very oblique cut, okay? Uh, if you're very cool, you could do it all with a knife, but I find it's easier to do it with the pruning shears. Now what you want to do is you want to take this cut and you want to make the tongue. Now, the tongue is basically just a slot that's going to be about two-thirds of the way from the bottom of the cut, uh, right around the point. So if you can think of like a little shark, its little mouth would be right around here. That's how I remember it. A little 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 shark. So then you want to cut a slot. Now this is why you have the glove on the other hand because you don't want to cut yourself. You also have to be careful of your thumb. So uh, let the knife do the work. Don't force it. Take your time. Okay, the knife is doing its work. We have a nice little slot. And then I'm gonna tilt it up a bit and we have a little shark, little bitey shark. Da -da 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 -da. Okay, now we're gonna do the same thing on the rootstock. So imagine this is growing in the ground. We're gonna make a cut about a third of the way down from the nose or two thirds of the way up from the bottom. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to make that little cut, which is called the tongue. And I'm going to do the same thing. Don't be in a rush. Let the knife do the work. Don't push it. Otherwise, you'll cut yourself. It's like making sushi. Okay. And with a good knife, the sharpness of the knife will do the cutting, not the pushing of the knife. That's the thing it took me many losses of blood to learn. Okay, so there again, you can see, I'm not sure if that's showing up in the camera, but there's the open mouth of the killer shark. 
Uh, okay, so there's my tongue, and I have a tongue on the Hold other. It still. Let me see. Okay. I'll point that with the knife here. Okay, so now, how does this work? Well, the two sharks have to bite each other. So there's the rootstock, there is the cyan, and the two tongues, this gets very kinky, have to go into each other. Now, sometimes you need to open their little mouths a bit with the knife. Remember, this is the rootstock. Normally, I wouldn't be ripping it out of the ground, so uh, use your imagination. So open those little mouths a little bit. And uh, connect the two. And can't quite see it, but and this one's going to require a little bit of. Oops. Yeah, you see. So sometimes that you overdo it, and then you have to do it again. So in this case, we're going to redo it. Uh, that was not quite a deep enough slot. So let's. Cut, and then we'll do this one more time. And um, hi there. Sorry for that little interruption, but sometimes you have to redo your cuts. That often happens. Uh, every piece of wood is a little different, depending on how springy it is. So don't be afraid to redo a graft if it's not perfect. Always leave yourself enough room. Uh, so you may have to redo it to get a better fit. So in this case, this is the same uh, rootstock and the same sign wood. I've just trimmed it again. So we're gonna join these uh, two tongues together. And again, the point is to um, match the, so the um, cambium on at least one side. So the cambium is in close contact between the rootstock and the cyan. So as you can see, this one actually seems to be working in both directions. Uh, it's actually slightly better on this side uh, because the uh, rootstock and the um, uh, cyan were roughly the same diameter. Uh, so that is a very stable connection. Uh, it's, it's got, uh, it's almost like a, a carpentry connection, like a tongue and groove kind of connection. Um, so that's very stable. And then you would tape that up the same way I, I did previously. Uh, and that's called the whip and tongue. Uh, whip is just a very old fashioned word for a twig. And tongue is the little uh, slot that you cut in that creates the little um, point that then uh, fits into the corresponding slot. So imagine two sharks uh, biting each other uh, and uh, you will basically be able to do the whip and tongue um, quite easily. The, cut going, going a third of the way from the point, third of the way down. And um, yeah, and don't be afraid to redo it if, if the fit isn't perfect, because that often happens. It's, it's kind of, you know, every tree, every twig is different. Um, and there you have it. That is a, a stable, stable connection. So if I was to uh, tape it off, I would, I would basically do it the same way I did before. I'd take my glove off because it's hard to tie itself but around and around just you know you don't have to overdo it it really is just to pr protect it from moisture the graft should be held together by the carpentry part of it and not the tape that's sort of a good rule the tape is more just to keep uh, the moisture in and uh, keep it um, from getting diseased but um, don't rely on the tape to hold the graft together because you're basically wanting the thing to be as strong as possible without the tape. It should hold uh, and then use the tape as the kind of, you know, backup uh, and uh, sealant as opposed to a structural thing. So again, I'm just gonna tie this. Uh, and it's the stretchier the tape, the better because it's actually it holds a little bit of uh, tension. Uh, but again, rubber bands work. Um, even insulating tape works, but this is nice because it's clear. So there you go. There's a whip and tongue. Okay. Hello, Grafters Exchange. So I'm uh, I'm Julian Spaden, and I'm the founder and director of Tele Agriculture. Uh, we're a cloud crowd community for creative cultivation. And uh, thanks to Margarita and Grafters Exchange for inviting me to to do a little presentation about the stuff that we've been doing. So uh, I'm an artist, researcher, curator, designer, and educator um, from Australia, and I'm based in, in Linz in Austria currently. I'm also finishing my PhD 
um, a few other things, of course, as well as running teleagriculture. Uh, I teach at the Interface Cultures Program. But of course, I'm here today to talk about teleagriculture. So we are a cloud cloud data platform, basically. Now, I want, I want to say at the very start that we, we are about building a digital global community. We're not necessarily focused on the technology. What we're mainly focused on, um, and as you can see here, we originally were looking at artists. Now we look at this term creative cultivation. But basically, we want to facilitate people growing their own food um, and integrating um, agriculture and food production into culture more. So we have this you know, quite cheesy tagline, putting the culture back in agriculture. Um, it's quite interesting here in Austria because Landwirtschaft is the word for agriculture and this is land economy. So, so it's a very interesting, you know, we have in English this tele, like this agriculture thing, but it's not very culture. And of course, um, Grafters Exchange is a great example of um, bringing the culture back into agricultural practices. So essentially we are um, running through an app and uh, this is currently being being built um, at the moment, this month, right now. Um, and so basically, we we provide uh, uh, services, including a sensor kit for gathering information um, for both yourself and for us in the in our wider research. Um, you have uh, your own dedicated service space. It's it's a private thing for you, um, and then everything is linked via the app. So on the app, you can talk with other people in the community, you can access the tutorials, you can view the archive of previous artworks. Um, and then of course, this is all open source. So it's all in a Git repository, so people can then actually contribute those things. So you don't just have to be contributing, making artwork or just, you know, kind of plugging it into your farm. You can also be doing innovative things. So I'm gonna go through some of these more community uh, and food orientated projects that we've been doing in this presentation, so focusing less on the, the electronics side of stuff. So a little bit of a history. Uh, we first had the idea of teleagriculture in 2018 at an MIT Global Community Summit, uh, Bio Summit think tank that I was a part of. And it was really interesting because to that point I'd run several hacker spaces and, and art organizations and research organizations, but so I was like, okay, let's just build a community where it's not, there's no agenda, it's not about anything. Um, how do you do that? And how do you do it in a way that you've got a startup element, but you're not a startup, you've got an art part, but you're not an art part. And then there's the food part. And then how do all these people work together in a community? You know, Because at the end of the day, we all eat food. So there's this essential kind of reality behind it all. And then it's like, okay, so we should all participate in how we grow food, how we make food, how we cook food, et cetera, et cetera. And so a lot of this, this initiative to the agriculture is about empathy building through participation in um, food production processes. So uh, we've had some good support over the years. We had a lot of support early on from Cotavamos Cultura in Portugal, from V2 Lab in Rotterdam, which we still have a, a partnership with, and also here locally in Linz through organizations such as Az Electronica, Stadtwerkstatt, the Donautics, the Schwemland, Hafengarten, and I'm going to introduce all of these a little bit as I, I go forward because um, in Linz we have it's called the Verein system, which is a Verein is like an association and everyone seems to be a part of five Vereins here. Um, and it's in terms of community, it's really interesting because it's actually a, a way of um, the state recognizing you as a non-for-profit or as an organization. And um, anyway, I'm gonna talk about this as, as we progress. So we did make a video. Uh, I'm not gonna play all of it. I'll just play the first few seconds of it. Teleagriculture, a crowd cloud data platform, platform for creative farming. Teleagriculture is a community platform for artists, designers, agriculturalists, and hobbyists providing a crowd cloud data network for information exchange and better, more sustainable urban food production, creativity and innovation, with the aim to put the culture back in agriculture. We offer a range of sensor kits that are linked to a dedicated server and database, along with our teleagriculture app, offering an open source platform for digital media production as well. Teleagriculture can be used to access, monitor, and share your agri-data across a global network, optimizing your food production on any scale in any environment. 
At the heart of our platform are our data sensing kits. These open source modulated devices can be customized to accommodate a wide range of inputs and outputs, including environmental sensors, lights, automated feeders, USB, HDMI, Bluetooth, Ethernet. Okay, so um, I'll just pause that there, but basically all of these videos are accessible either from our website or from my personal Vimeo, which is Julian Faden um, on Vimeo. But I, um, I'll just move on from, from this video because it's quite long and it's, it's also, to be honest, this was a video that we did as a promo and it, it was quite, quite nice because it got us some funding, but again, it's quite problematic because like most advertisements, it, it kind of shoeboxes what you are and who you are. And, um, yeah, so, so anyway, you can watch the rest of that later. It's, it's a nicely made video anyway. So I have a bit of a background in community engagement. Um, one of the first major initiatives I was doing was through Awesome Arts Australia. Um, I'm from a remote, uh, the Naluma country up in the northwest of Australia, um, living with a lot of indigenous communities up there. And so when I was kind of finished my art degree, I wanted to give back a little bit up into those communities. So I was working with Awesome Arts Australia, but it was quite problematic because we have this um, thing in Western Australia where the mining companies are the ones that are sponsoring all of the arts and culture in the state because all of our money comes from mining. And this is something which only recently this year has actually been addressed at a government level. And so for me, I, I never, I didn't really ever like working for any of these organizations in Western Australia because they're all funded by mining companies. Um, so I was in here in Lynn and then I came back and was actually thinking, okay, I want to start my own community. Um, and Dogbot is a really interesting global community. It's actually founded by Douglas Rapetto and Columbia University. Um, and now they're, a, they're everywhere around the world. There's over 100 chapters. But um, I really like this motto because the whole, the whole organization, DocBot, is for people doing strange things with electricity. So it's a very non-binding, non-specific way of describing what it is. And also the formats can be whatever. So it was a really nice thing to be part of a global organization that we were handling in our own unique localized way. And I think these models are very inspirational and, and I... Um, definitely have, have adopted them with my teleagriculture planning of how we build this kind of global community because obviously with agriculture, it's a very in-person kind of scenario. And so how do we, you know, connect and, uh, and build a community globally of all of these kind of, you know, little nodes. So I've done other community engagements. Some of the better ones was um, I was the living in the first ever smart house in Australia as it was being built when we got the new national broadband network in 2011 as a geek in residence. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's a really crazy residency because it's um, a lot of cow farms and university um, people there. That's the town. It's a farming town and a university town. Um, and I was there to do iterative artworks in response to all the internet of things, things that they were um, installing in the house. So it was a really crazy residency because I'd kind of wake up and then these technicians would come in and install um, some like smart fridge and then I'd be there trying to make artwork about smart fridges or with smart fridges or something. So, But more importantly, it was really uh, an interesting model because it was where I learned that you should always um, preach the unconverted, so to speak. So I think a lot of ecology and a lot of art and a lot of these communities that we have um, I'm not saying grafters exchange, but you know, a lot of these communities we have like here in Austria, for example, farming collectives are for people that are already interested in these things. And they're people that are already recycling and not using plastic and doing all these really important things for the environment. But to be honest, they're not really the people I'm interested in changing the minds of and building empathy for, um, ecosystems and food production. It's everyone else, you know, it's, they're the problem. Um, and you know, this is, I think a, a problem that we have that I realized through this residency that we should be focusing on the people that know nothing and the people that um, aren't interested. And I know it's more difficult because it's nice to talk to like-minded people, but I think that's, that's the challenge and the responsibility that we, that we have with these kind of initiatives and these kind of um, uh, endeavors. Okay. So a few more that I did, this is embodied reality systems. Um, this was engaging, um, like mainly schools and stuff in Brighton with um, virtual reality 
Um, when I first started my PhD in Brighton, I, I initiated this collective and then just two more. One of them was Digital Ping Pong, which is the first ever hackerspace for luxury fashion designers. Um, I was head of innovative media at London College of Fashion and we decided to make a, a space where students could drop in, um, uh, which was staffed once a week and every two weeks we had a little event. Um, and it was, it was great. It was an amazing thing. Again, people that know nothing about technology, many of which were not so interested in technology, but they, they'd come and then it was a lot of kind of going, you know, not being evangelical and going, technology is the future. Just like, you know, personalized farming isn't necessarily the future, but it's, you know, it's helping and you need to know about these things. So it's kind of, again, it's a similar approach to what I use now um, with, with teleagriculture because a lot of farmers and a lot of people that are there at your event, um, I know uh, the same. They're like, why would I use technology? Because, you know, I'm here, I'm watching my crops. I don't, I'm not interested. Um, for example, um, I like to access this from those points of view. So like for me, I use my teleagriculture kits for everything. I mean, I use them when I'm making koji to make miso, you know, um, because I have climate control. And so the point is that like, instead of buying all these different random stuff, you can get to know how to use our thing yourself, and then you can use it across a wide range of different things. But anyway, I'm, I'm getting a bit um, off the topic. So finally, I also did a, um, a lab, Embodied Realities Lab in Guadalajara for um, working with indigenous Azteca students. And I run the Mixed and Augmented Reality Art Organization, which is the first art organization focused in the field of augmentation aesthetics. So we're a very informal for academia um, collective. We have, um, if you actually look at the website, look at the exhibitions, we have a lot of artists that exhibit across multiple of these five events that we've done over 10 years. Um, the reason we don't do so many events, we have other talks and smaller things, but these are like a major event. And... Each one takes a long time because the, my approach is you build a micro community for each project. Like let's say Data Body is Artifact, this was in Japan, and we built a community of writers. Um, in the end, we had two curators, we had people doing live performance, and then we had the art exhibition with people writing papers, doing demos of other things. And the idea is that over the space of the summer, this project would evolve over three months of discourse, and then we kind of all come together in person and everyone meets and everyone lives together in the same big brother house kind of deal. And then we make this art thing happen. And it's a really beautiful process because then it also involves these everyday things like eating together and waiting for someone in the shower and, you know, just these general, you know, very human things that I think particularly when we're looking at augmented and mixed and virtual reality, we're not thinking about, you know, like the everyday, we're always thinking about the virtual. And I think with, you know, it's the whole thing with gardening that's beautiful as a community thing because we work together. But then also, if you look at a lot of community gardens, it's people have their own plots and they maybe have a five minute chat. So it's about building depth of discourse, you know. And what's really nice about marart.org is we launched it, I see here in 2013 in Sydney, and we're presenting our 10th anniversary presentation there in Barcelona this year. Um, and also, I'm presenting teleagriculture for the first time in a in an academic conference at, at this conference. Okay, so back to teleagriculture, a little bit more about us. This was our, uh, this is our team of kind of who's been working with us. We also have a couple of other people like Manola that's been doing some data science. We have other artists that have been involved, but essentially in terms of our main planning um, and, and conversations we have, um, it's mainly us four. Um, and at the end of the day, the core team is actually myself and Daniel Artemendi. So we've been working together for, for quite a few years. And after I first had this idea at MIT, uh, Danny and I were kind of working a lot on the hardware and then kind of building some of the artworks. Um, because one of the things is it's, it's such a vague kind of community and people are like, well, what is it? And I'm hoping that at the end of this talk, you will understand what it is, but it takes a little conversation to understand because it is multi-layered. It's um, loose in some connections. It's, it's, it's heavy in others. And um, the projects are very diverse. So all we can do is document that really well and present it. And then through things like presentations like this and workshops, like the ones I'll be doing in Colgate in April, um, 
you know, really consolidate it. And again, it's about people participating rather than just reading it off a website to understand what we are and to participate. Okay, so um, like I said, we started at MIT and have been back there a couple of times since, which is really nice. Um, we were in Algarve for a long time working with brackish water in estuary systems. So looking at slightly saline water and, and approaches for modulated farming. Um, I really like these, these difficult use cases. Living where I live in Austria, it's, it's a joke here with farmers where all you need to do is sneeze and a seed is planted. Um, it's very, very easy to grow food here in this in this country, and everyone pretty much in Austria has an auntie and uncle, a brother or sister or themselves that are farming. Self, uh, self like mini farms and homes and, and even on balconies is very, very popular here. Um, it's actively in, encouraged, so um, there's not really a need for things like gorilla farming or whatever, but um, it's interesting, again, as a use case, because these people feel like they don't need you to tell them how to do anything and they don't need this technology. So these are all in interesting um, kind of use cases. And for this, when we're developing the kits, we started thinking about what Oron Katz from Symbiotica recently started calling metabolic rift technology. So what that means is he's talking about how when we use like aquaculture, we use chemicals for the fish and we use specially formulated food to feed them rather than natural things. So we're not trying to like restore or replicate nature we're trying to replace it and this is hugely problematic just like monsanto with its genetic modification just like monsanto with its data analysis just like monsanto with everything um to think that a pharmaceutical company buyer basically at monsanto is someone that we want responsible for our crops is, is ludicrous but of course you guys uh in the states and you know that better than better than most so um anyway so we were looking at and this is why i use aquaponics quite a lot because um, I have a background in marine biology, and when you do microscopy of this, you realize that the microbes that are being made by aquaponic systems, so for example, currently we're using native fish from the Danube to restore river microbe profiles in soil along the Danube in areas where uh, the Danube used to flood. So the whole of Linz where I live used to be a fluvial agricultural area. It's now an urbanized industrial area. Um, but dug underneath all of those layers of concrete and building sand is this really amazing river soil that is a really fine quality soil um, and it's full of microbes still and this can be reactivated. So we're looking at addressing this idea of, of rift technologies as, as Aaron calls it. So like I said, we've done a lot of different experiments and projects I'm going to gloss over a little bit. So working with microscopy and videography, when, sorry, when we're in Algarve in Portugal, I actually had this really beautiful community building initiative where I was there for six weeks and every week we had a different artist in residence. So we had six weeks, six artists in residences, me there the whole time. There were crossovers between some of them at one point um, for my, during my birthday actually, which is actually today. Um, happy birthday, me. Um, we actually had four artists there and this was quite fun. But so during this period, it was this really nice, okay, who are we as a community? What do we want to do? How many other people are interested? And just pumping out little experiments and work. So using microscopy and, and the weather data to make audio, which is what you're seeing here. I was doing other things with, with locals. So this whole area used to be aquaponics, uh, aquaculture, sorry. Now it's just a, a very salty estuary. Um, and I was working with another art collective there on building these floating gardens for desalinating water. Um, this actually evolved into a project for the Mediterranean for the refugees that were coming um, through the Mediterranean that would quite often their boats would capsize. And the idea would be these were floating bubbles of water and we planted tomato seeds in there so you could get some vitamins and some water. The idea never happened and it's actually quite stupid because it's made of plastic, but this is one of the, the ongoing projects, like we said. Um, so the idea is this is something that was started. And then in the community, other people that are interested can then go and, and continue this project and build it further. So I'm really the apple seed guy, like planting all the seeds. And then the idea is that other people will come and grow the trees and then graft their own bits onto them and et cetera, et cetera like grasses exchange anyway okay so just quickly some other things that we did uh, obviously we we need to make the tech as simple as possible so we're looking at 
how can we do it? So it's a plug in and play thing if that's all you're interested in, but then also looking at different ways of interfacing data because I personally hate reading numbers and databases. Excel is my least favorite thing that exists on a computer. Um, so here on the right, you can see this is what I call like a node-based visualization system where these are three different kits that I have. And you can see the when the lines are going crazy and jutting in and out a lot, I know that there's a problem with that particular, whatever that thing is. And all I do is I just press, um, it's a touchscreen interface, you just press the circle and then it will tell you for that kit what that data that's got a problem is. So for example, I press it and if it's pH, I know, okay, I've got to do something uh, to adjust the acidity in my fish tank, for example. So the idea is, again, it's about making this stuff as less impactful as possible. So things like notifications through the app and stuff like this. So, that, you know, like just say I'm going to America in a few days. While I'm in America, if there's a problem with my aquaponics, I see it, I get an alert in the app, and it tells me to tell my friend that they need to go and check whatever the problem is. So again, another feature like this is um, for data entry, because I, again, I don't like manual data entry, I developed a little augmented reality app where you can do the, the strip tests for aquariums and for aquaponics and aquaculture systems, hydroponic systems as well. And all you do is you dip the strip in and then you uh, use the AR app and it automatically uploads the, the data. Um, it, it recognizes it's, it's working with a particular company that makes these strips. So it's, it's catered for one company, of course, because it, it, that's, that's how it works. But anyway, and again, this is something that could be developed further with other things and other machine learning and color detection to go like, okay, my water is too dirty, I need to change it, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is that a lot of these things can lead towards remote monitoring and even remote um, um, optimization and things like this. And then finally, we also do the video tutorials, which again, are not on site at the moment because we're getting them edited really, really nicely. And so this is something that will be be online within uh, probably in May. Okay, so a few artworks. Um, these are some kits that I was building and the first artwork evolved out of this system. So looking, okay, what does it actually mean if we're making this community where it's all about showing the food that you make and showing uh, living, you know, living data from living ecosystems and you know, the focus is not anthropomorphic in any way, really. It's not about humans. It's about all the things that we do with food to stay alive and uh, as humans, as a species. And so um, we're looking, okay, well, what happens if biotopes speak to one another? So I built these microbiotopes. This is like a, a real simple kitchen system where the fish are aesthetic fish and their waste fertilizes the, the herbs. It doesn't look so healthy, um, here, it's it's the start of the system. But anyway, so this was looking at lights and what does that mean? And we we're thinking, okay, well, it evolved into this project called Rhizomatic Bias. So we we're looking at, okay, Monsanto, for example, privileges monocultures. We all know this. And so when they're looking at the way that they gather data, because they have data systems similar to this now that cost about $2,000 more and do less and are contained within their agenda, their kits optimize the most successful kit. So it's just, it's a Darwinist survival of the fittest, top-down hierarchical idea of how ecosystems work. Now, of course, we know that's not how they work. Um, and it's, it's a cyclic system where all discrete elements are important. Um, so it's, we were looking at this in terms of Dawkins and mimetics and thinking, okay, memes, trolls. So we're like, okay, so what if the most normal or the most successful kit, the fittest kit, instead of um, just, being optimized for itself, what if it actually cyber bullies the less, you know, normal or whatever, or the less cool kits? What would that mean? And what does it mean if actually fish communicate to one another and plants and these environments communicate to one another in the same kind of ways that we do today? So we built this kind of weird, wacky chatbot social media network, which is, again, if you're part of the community, you could use the chatbot network and have your whatever. So like I could have my aquaponics farms here uh, in Linz having a weird, stupid troll online social media interactions with a kit that you guys set up as part of Grafters Exchange, for example. And they have these weird conversations that evolve. But 
anyway, so just just quickly, at this time I was in Rotterdam doing residency in V2. Um, I did my aquaponics training there. I, I, I've got a marine biology degree, but I've never trained properly in aquaponics, so this was really cool. And we started using the tilapia. Now, I'm mentioning tilapia because I use them for this, this exhibition, and then during COVID, I actually started a tilapia aquaponics farm um, at a farming association I'm a part of as a kind of a response to COVID and, um, yeah, anyway. Okay, so that was one fish, but then another fish that's really important to us here in Linz is the grundle. So this is a type of goby that comes from the Black Sea, gets sucked up into fish, into the bilge tanks of, of barges that are touring tourists on Blue Danube cruises and stuff. What's really interesting is humans connected the rivers from the Danube to the Northern Rhine all the way to coming out at Rotterdam. So this fish actually traveled the same journey as me from here in Austria up through central Germany to Rotterdam in, in the Netherlands. So it, I had this kind of affinity with the fish, but it's also in Linz a very celebrated fish because it's an invasive species. It's an ugly fish. Um, as you can see, it's really small, so people don't really fish it to eat it, even though there's an endless supply of them, and they've taken over the ecosystem. But people don't care. So it's this kind of interesting thing because people are really anti-immigration here, but then they have no problem with a migrational fish that's invasive. Uh, whereas myself as an Australian, we're kind of the opposite of that side of things. Um, and we're very anti-invasive species. So anyway, so we started this collective called Untergrandl. It's a fisher punk zine and a fisher punk community. Um, there are a lot of punks and hippies in, in uh, Upper Austria here. Um, there's a whole scene of uh, kind of like um, non-glamping kind of van life. Um, people doing like traveling, obviously we're in Europe, so uh, people travel with sound systems and do these kind of rave sound system things and live in their trucks. And there's this whole thing. And so there's a lot of self-sufficiency from that as well. And um, we formed Untergrund as a zine to kind of give you ideas and tips of how to do stuff. So showing you like how to make a fishing hook out of a beer can, how to make a rig to catch a grundle. You can see here there's a recipe for a grundle burger, um, which, you know, telling you how you can best fillet uh, this tiny kind of fish. And, you know, it's 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 just like a normal white fish. It's, it tastes very similar to tilapia. Like it has not really, it's like a flavorless white fish. So in theory, you would think that people are really interested in this. But um, through this collective, we, we've done a, a, a few different things. A, a thing that I'm not, I haven't mentioned here is, um, I were catching these fish and drying them out to, as a way of not having to pay anything, but then also microbe load my tilapia. So the tilapia were in a complete artificial environment using groundwater, so rainwater. Um, so it's very clean water, but it's very lacking in any kind of microbe. Um, and I was feeding my tilapia grundle, dried grundle, um, as a way of kind of transferring some of these microbes from, from in the Danube to these fish and also to make them more healthy in Sarah. And we, we were doing all kinds of things like this, but that's a, a different project. So um, out of this also Grundle TV, which is a live 24-hour stream of the Grundle fish. Um, this is the installation of Rhizomatic Bias V2 at Ars Electronica and at Stadtwerkstatt. Uh, this is the chatbot that you can see here on the right. These are all the pieces of data in this circle in the middle. You can see that Starbuckstat is the most normal kit, so that's why it's talking the most smack on the right. It's saying the most, and then what it produces for V2 Lab, for example, is a lot of noise pollution that stresses the fish, bad UV light with the green light on the on the aquaponics system. So basically, it's Starbuckstat is cyberbullying V2 to death in this scenario. Now, disclaimer: that's not actually happening. It's, it was monitored and it was adjusted at the end of each day. It was just a speculative kind of a, a provocation. So this is what it looked like. Yeah. So I was very weird uh, walking past this, for example, at Stavrikstad on the way to a concert, and you're like, what, what is happening? Um, anyway, so I move on to Trajohof, which is another community I'm a part of. It's a cultural association at the intersection of um, living, farming, and culture. We have a lot of different studios. It's a very cheap membership. It's a hundred euros a, a year, and you can use all of our workshops. We have band rehearsal spaces. Um, you can sign up to be a part of the community farm, or you can, like I did, you can apply to be a farmer in residence and use one of our 
three greenhouses that we have. Um, and you can you can do it's really cool. You can do lots of cool things. And I actually lived there for a year during the first year of COVID here, where you can see my tiki bar that I built. Um, now, this tiny house is a really weird quarantine bubble, to be honest. It's very small. But of course, being on a farm was quite nice because we could get out into nature, unlike most people living in the city. Of course, in winter, it's a bit shitty. But from this, actually, I, I started working a lot. Um, being a part of Traihop, I actually joined another community, which is called Donaltics. So Donaltics is a cultural association um, of Orion uh, that's designed for artists and people making stuff with um, mechanics and technology and radios and electronics and stuff on the Danube. And this is the ship, the Eleonora. Um, and I was there for six weeks without internet uh, in at the start of the COVID um, pandemic. It was really weird because I didn't even have a, enough solar power um, to power my laptop. So I was really just on a phone that wasn't connected to anything. And it was really lovely because I was reading a lot of books again and um, doing work along the riverbank and, and farming along there and fixing up this old ass boat. And so it was really cool because my process was like, I didn't have a job either because of COVID. So basically I was in the morning reading books. Like I read Neuromancer and I read Umberto Echo and was looking at this idea of islands of the day before and like subjective histories and how we construct subjective histories on places. So this boat has been an artist in residence boat since 2008 and there's so many different projects and everyone that does a project on there, it's really funny, thinks of themselves as being the only person ever that did a project at about the Danube on this boat. And of course, everyone, there's lots of other people doing that. So this was looking at this and I was thinking about this in terms of like Deleuze and Guattari's assemblage and like the fold and layering of stories into a singular entity and and, you know, for me, this is what Islands of the Day Before was kind of about as well. But importantly, it looks to the past, you know, and it's looking at histories and prehistories and how all of this influences the assemblage of meaning. Um, I also look at all of this. Um, so this is moving into what, what the current projects are that we're doing. Um, I look at this in terms of a, a kind of a more critical engagement with ecology and Anthropocene. Um, I'm by no means an optimist about climate change. I'm very much a, um, a critic, a critical person about it. Um, I, I think that we need to actually be really serious about it and not, you know, kind of be like, oh, if we do this, it'll do this. It's like, if we don't do this, we're going to die. You know, this kind of more drastic approach. Um, but anyway, this all consolidated with um, my work that I was doing on translating the history of the Eleonora from when it first started. This is in its first form. Um, and reading about Amin Medosh's concept of information islands, um, I find this really engaging and really interesting. Um, this notion of, for example, pirate radios as um, islands of resistance within, you know, the whole free radio frequencies that are occurring. And who owns them and what protocols exist? And I'm interested in, in this idea of protocols of data, data society because as much as we like to be analog and out in our fields, we are living in this, this highly networked, highly controlled society. And it's all based on algorithms. I mean, even farming is a, an algorithm. It's a process-based step where there's a formula you follow in order for it to be successful. You know? so, um, but anyway, back to teleagriculture and more recent updates. We won the Vienna Design Week Urban Food Design Challenge with this installation. Um, here you can see the kit. You can see a little home aquaponics system. It's very successful, as you can see from the, um, that's actually a habanero plant. It's lemongrass and uh, some other stuff. Um, the food down there is all food that we produce with our aquaponic systems and, and some other information. But what was really nice about this event was it was the first time we did a public dinner and started using food as a way to interface everyday folk with um, all of these deeper conversations about ecology and technology and nature and um, yeah, all of these things. What was really interesting about this uh, this dinner was we grew everything within uh, two kilometers of that little trailer that I was living in at the time. So all of the Dreyerhof, even the oil came from the farmer, two farms away from us. Um, and it was this beautiful thing because in Vienna, they source everything. Uh, they have beautiful markets, but, you know, they have like a very limited palette of food is grown in Austria. And people with the bio movement aren't importing a lot, so the selections become a lot less. So in Vienna, for example, it's like, oh, I'm getting this food from, I don't know, like Portugal. It's like, yeah, but you could grow that here if you 
time it right and if you follow the right you know algorithm if you follow the right format to do it and this kind of this dinner proved that a lot and we got a lot of really cool feedback and we actually fed 240 people over two days um in a meal format so it kind of it wasn't like you're just in the public and you get a sample when you're at walmart on some i don't know bullshit it's like no you actually sit down and talk to us we're feeding you like a really nice meal of 100% bio, 100% locally made food. Let's have a conversation about that. And so it was kind of nice to, to do this. And that evolved into the projects that we're doing now. Um, like I said, I grew a lot of tilapia myself. This was my, my greenhouse for a year and a half. They're the fish now. They're indoors and they're pets. Um, yeah, so I just because of time skipped through a couple of these projects. This was a stomach step project we did about asking... When we grow farms, what does it mean to talk to farms? So we're looking at this idea of corn. Kernels, because it's, it's a pun, because of course um, you get kernels on computers and you have kernels on corn. So like, okay, what happens if you talk to a corn and then the corn talks back to you? But moving, moving into our current state of affairs and just kind of finishing off, On this currently we're based at we have um, some land and some projects happening at the Dryhof in Leonding which is just south of Linz I have um, a farm here at my studio an urban farm and we have some farms at Hafengarten so Hafengarten is an interesting situation it has the original like I talked about the soil from the fluvial systems it is the last remaining farm in the fluvial agricultural areas of Linz. I'll just show you this really quickly. Um, here, so this is this is Linz in the 1960s. This is it in the 1990s. So as you can see, this was all farming area. Now it's all industrial area. And Schwemland is a, a community that I'm a part of that is working on addressing this with green architecture and with a range of other things. We're working with them and so we had this idea um, through working at the Harpen Garden of, okay, let's let's farm crops that Austrians don't normally farm and don't think are possible. So let's farm random versions of corn. Let's use mill for farming. Let's um, grow shiso as a kind of response to, if you're doing public dinners, you don't want to use public, you don't want to use paper plates. Everyone goes, yeah, they're recyclable, but, you know, once you put food on them, they're not. Ceramic plates with COVID are a problem with health. So we're like, okay, let's go Japanese and let's grow shiso leaves that you can eat straight off of and then eat the plates and looking at edible plates and things like this. Um, we were doing cool things like being on Dorf TV and, and if you're interested in, in all the stuff that we have with the communities in Linz, most communities here have a, um, a, a video channel on Dorf TV. So some other things that we're working on just to kind of to finish on, we're doing some bamboo dirt rice aquaponics. We're working with a friend in Bangladesh to do river based aeroponics and aquaponic systems to prevent malaria. Um, this is my urban farm here where I'm living. We're this year using cotton to look at, um, cotton absorbs airborne pollution really well. So looking at plant and cotton, again, a crop that's not grown in Austria. Um, and also using slater beetles and worm farms to process heavy metals in the soil in these urban farm environments. Um, this is even more urban. This is the main city bridge under the bridge where we started a small corn farm as a bit of an experiment because uh, quite often people, drunk men, use this area to, to pee on the way to cross the Danube to go to the other side of, of um, the city. We were thinking, okay, well, if we plant plants in this area, which we are allowed to do, will people, you know, like pee on them or trash them? And it was really lovely because they didn't. And so this is a, a really nice restoration in humanity kind of thing and um, this evolved into the riverbank buffet project that we did um, which I'll be I'll be talking more about and I've got some papers on uh, coming up soon and basically we did a dinner event for the general public we had over 300 people attend the event and we lost count or stopped counting at that point um, it was during the opening of ours electronica and Stavrechtstadt festivals and basically we created a menu with 10 different dishes, small little bites of high microbe loaded food. So multiple different ferments um, with a fermented drink with an artwork that was based on microbes. So 
basically we we're looking at redefining Austrian meals. So I would, for example, a, a bread dumpling, a semolcanoto is a really cheap, um, basically no nutritional value. It's, it's white toast bread that you make into a ball with an egg and parsley and that's it. And you eat it with like roast pork and, and sauerkraut and things like this. We were like, okay, we could make this thing really healthy because it's super cheap. So we added beer fermented cheese. So you're getting some microbes from that. Lacto fermented berry sauce, honey, um, and also putting beer in the actual. And we also put miso in there. So it had all these different microbes kind of. Um, so this one ball became this kind of worthless ball of bread. And then it became a huge healthy microbe hit. So just a, a little quick video because of time. I'll just show a tiny bit of this video. Yeah, so it's this really lovely event. It started uh, in the afternoon, as, as you can see here during daylight, and um, it started around the time people were kind of finishing work. So here you're seeing it's mainly like friends and an art crowd, and it's really relaxed and informal. And then what happened was as the sun started to go down, the, you know, our lights came on and all of a sudden we weren't just something embedded in the landscape as some random event that was occurring in, in a leisurely area of the Danube. We became a focus and then more and more people came and we had this beautiful food. These are American crawfish that we caught out of the Danube. This is all fish from uh, Fisherman Franz that I work with, who's the last licensed fisherman in the Danube and, and part of the Hafen Garden. Uh, he's the family that owns it. Um, this is Dornau duck. It's it's um they cull the ducks in the Danube because there are too many. Um, they're also an invasive species, and usually they don't do anything with them. So we we're like, well, why don't you feed the public with them? And that's my corn that I grew. This is beet true tartare using miso for umami, um, yeah, and so on. So we had several artworks that we showed. This was a work I made Swan Tweety, which is an accelerometer, basically tweet to the government every time a boat went too fast about the impact that it has on the local ecology of the river. Um, it was quite a famous story where the city of Linz, um, we had floods last year and the city of Linz posted everywhere on social media that they saved the swan nest um, because they moved it one meter back up onto some rocks. Now this was, this was totally ludicrous. Um, and then what happened was uh, when the floods went down, they moved it back. But then when the, the little signets hatched, high-speed boats were going by and the wake that they were producing, the waves that they're causing, drowned every single one of those swans. And they didn't post a single social media post about it. And so, you know, this is kind of the thing. Governments like to greenwash what they're doing and they don't really do shit. So it's like we need to, you know, um, actually be calling them out on it. And so this project is an ongoing project now that it's now based on the Tron River, uh, which comes off of the Danube and it's an ongoing thing. Okay, so some other talks that we're doing. These are some ongoing projects we're doing with like chromatography and soil sampling. This was a protest against the fireworks they have there every year, which is totally destroying the ecosystem. Um, we had other artists doing talks. And then from this, this kind of led towards us. Uh, we won the Early Iron Fix in the Future Prize, which is a, um, the main cultural radio station here in Austria. Um, and we presented at the Market of the Future, the Markt des Zukunft, uh, sorry, where we were looking at how we can actually get funding as a kind of a non-for-profit that's not really a startup and not really an art or, you know, we're just a random ragtag community. So it's like really difficult to apply for funding that's enough for us to actually operate on a, um, on a full-time for me level, to be honest. Um, okay, so I already mentioned Islands of the Day before. This is the current project looking at augmenting and restoring Historical microbial ecologies in the fluvial regions of Linz. Um, I'm going to skip the description of this because I'm out of time. Um, but like I said, so all our projects we're doing are kind of about working with existing communities, building communities, but more importantly, allowing the general public to access things that we're doing outside of the community. And the kind of the last thing that I'll quickly show you is this climate oasis, the Klima oasis. So I'm working on this with Shremland to build an aquaponics education center. 
Um, this is a really cool project that has a tiny forest, like the tiniest forest. <laughs> um, and there's also, we're restoring local frog populations that almost became extinct because they have no habitat because it's industrialized now. Um, so there's a frog breeding program. There's Biodema, so there's using the waste from the fisherman, fisherman Franz, his fished waste to create um, fertilizer. We use stinging nettle for fertilizer. There's many, many little projects going on here. And it's, it's currently like three or four of us driving these projects, but we have a whole impl implication, uh, implementation plan with students. And, and like I said, trying to bring in random people, like our goal loosely, laughingly, we said about this project was we're in the middle of the industrial area if we can get just one of these companies to be buying our biofertilizer and not using their chemicals and going completely to zero carbon green, we've done our job. So there are other organizations in Linz. There's Tuba, Time's Up Boating Academy, the Donautics, Halfbit.org, Schwemland. You can find out more about all of these from Dorf TV. Um, also, I did a Leonardo laser talk last week uh, for work, which you can find out more information about. Um, I'm part of a chili tasting community called Open Source, and we have the Open Source Wiki. Yes, that is a good pun. Um, yeah, so if you want to find out more about any of this stuff, I think contacting me is the best way because I, I'm putting all this myself on my website at the moment. I've just, uh, I don't know, been quite chaotic lately. Um, just some other projects we're doing. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff we're doing. I've got student projects. Um, yeah, if you want to know more, you can ask me. You can read about it online in the Versurgeren. I have an article about how we augment ecological aesthetics. I'm bringing with me to Colgate a few copies of the Trebgut, which is the Schwemland annual publication, and the book Metamorphosis, which was a book that we made at the, the art university here. Finally, I will be doing stuff with microbes and biomic, microbiomic empathy with Rowan van Dierendonk and Buffalo. So this is what, I, what I'll be doing for five weeks when I'm in the States. Um, coming in two days actually, um, where we're looking at using and what happens if we eat the same fermented foods? Do we assimilate as people genetically? Do we become more similar emotionally? And all these kind of interesting things. So thanks for thanks for listening. I realize it's, it's a bit of a long talk. Um, thanks again for inviting me. And it's a really lovely event. I'm really sorry I couldn't come. And I hope you enjoy the rest of it. So thanks everybody. Hi, um, Grafters Exchange. Thank you so much to Margareta for inviting me to contribute um, to this um, wonderful hot compost pile. Um, I'm going to speak to a project that I worked on over three years called Hard Graft. Um, and this project um, comes from Dublin, Ireland. Um, and I'll speak a little bit to how the project came to be. Um, and then I'd like to read from an essay by geographer Karen Till, who spoke to me and then um, wrote, to, uh, wrote a really nice response to um, the project. But then I'd also kind of like to move to where things went post the project, um, because it really did create a hot compost pile of um, community academics, researchers, and um, yeah, it's nice to have this opportunity to, to reflect on it. So I will begin by speaking to where the project came from. So in 2006, I was invited to be artist in residence in um, Studio 468, and this is Studio 468 here. This is a studio residency that is in um, attached to a community centre, and it's in an area of Dublin called Dublin 8. That's the postcode. Um, and my initial project was... Um, a community garden project that lasted um, five years. 
And um, currently the site is um, going to be um, developed. But that project um, set off a lot of kind of my thinking um, and has led to sort of the directions of my work. So the orchard fascinates me um, as it's a place that lies between the, the domestic and agricultural. It's a type of hybrid space. And um, in looking to kind of the term graft, to graft is to create unlikely encounters, hybrid mixes, novel surfaces. So there's already this nice kind of entangled written richness that um, brought me to thinking about um, the word graft. Um, and as, as we know, I mean, the gorilla grafters um, or fellow the, our fellow grafters, to graft is to cut a branch or scion from a mature fruit tree and attach it to a root stock in order to propagate that fruit. It is how fruit trees are reproduced. So using a sharp blade, we splice the branch at the right angle so that the two cadium layers of the root stock and branch meet, match, and mingle. We then bind the root and branch with plastic tape and dip the connection in wax to protect the wound from disease. This wound then heals and the tree begins to develop and grow. So I've become attracted to this act as a metaphor of healing. It's a process that requires great care. Um, and concentration to, to ensure you have the right cut, the right join. And I suppose the project um, came to think like, how do we repair our landscapes, our cities and our relationships? In the current political climate, it feels like it's going to take a huge amount of collective graft to get there. So the project is one small attempt to instigate a different way of being in the city. Introducing public spaces that are tasks, landscapes that you act in, feel part of and connected to. Something else that attracted me to um, ideas of grafting is it's is that it's an affordable way of reproducing trees in great number and with little or no budget. So essentially the scion or branch is free and the rootstock costs all of one euro. And it's, it's also a kind of lost skill in Ireland anyway. So it was a skill that um, was great to introduce to um, community gardeners um, and um, green and ecology groups um, within the area of Dublin 8. So the hard graft project revives this lost knowledge and brings it back to community. Hard graft's research continues my interest in issues of sustainable cities, land access, food access, and spaces of commoning. Through this project, I, pl I playfully tie a planting grafting project to an unearthing of questions of labor. Um, hard graft towards community orchard begins with fruit tree grafting. So the graft is the tree's rhizome. By cutting branches, scion, we can quick, quite quickly graft and reproduce many trees. By collectively grafting, planting and meeting, we create solidarity and alliance. Working with community groups in St. Andrew's Community Centre and Dolphin House, with other local groups in the area, heritage apple trees from University College Dublin are collectively crafted towards future orchards for Dublin 8. These final orchards um, will in included grafted trees and a mix of fruit and nut trees. And the project negotiated with community members and stakeholders on where the orchards would be planted. So in putting forward the proposal for a citizen artist um, award, which is run by a community arts organization in Dublin called Common Ground, I took into account the current climate and moment we're living in. It feels like a difficult moment to introduce a sense of optimism, openness, otherness, and ideas of abundance that we are, because when we are hounded with ideas of scarcity, fear, and protective nationalisms daily, I see the graft with all its rhizomatic potential and the hard graft project as creating a counter narrative to the depressing, narrow minded, ecologically and socially damaging politics of this moment. So, embedded in the project is the idea of developing a local commons. 
Silvia Federici states, the idea of the commons is the idea of reclaiming the capacity to control our life, to control the means of our reproduction, to share them in egalitarian ways and to manage them collectively. Community orchards are a commons. Um, they're green spaces in the city where communities are able to access free food and be connected with a seasonal cycle. They create spaces where people can relax and meet and provide a place for pollinators. The future orchard are spaces that are held in common ownership. No single individual owns the trees. Um, the trees are there for any resident who cares to picnic under, climb on or harvest from. The orchard space becomes a place to observe and stay connected to seasonal cycles. Something quite invisible for numerous city dwellers surrounded by glass, brick and concrete. So the um, orchard project was inspired by an orchard that um, is in my neighborhood. Um, and it's at the back of um, an art and design college um, here in Dublin called IADT. And I um, walk this through this orchard regularly um, with my um, children um, where we climb trees. Um, and I suppose this, um, connection and belonging over time um, has seen, has had me see the value of um, what essentially in Ireland anyway is quite a privileged space um, because obviously you need um, access to land to be able to um, produce um, an orchard. But here this orchard is on um, uh, within an art institute. So it has become um, a community orchard um, and a space that yeah has kind of really inspired me and we have um, harvested from it there's plums pears and apples and um, I wanted to replicate the space um, across the city and the neighborhood of Dublin 8 so that's kind of where the hard, hard graft um, project kind of ideas um, begin. So now just kind of re returning to sort of the thought behind the project and um, the essay by Karen Till, which I'll read from now. So what is hard graft? It's an assemblage of political and ethical commitments encompassing feminism, ecology and the commons as an alternative to neo um, liberal domination of public space. We need to reworld, reimagine, relive, and reconnect with each other in multi species well being. The earthbound can take heart as well as action, says the wonderful Donna Haraway. Grassroots activists and artists face a tough moment in imagining more just cities in which to live. Reflecting upon this moment, um, my project asks how do we respond with care and bring um, people along? So Hardgraft offers Dublin's residents an invitation to work with multi-species others through learning about heritage fruit trees and planting a commons together. It is located in a former inner city working class area mar marked by decades of disinvestment and displacement, and now housing a mixed demographic. Um, the project has initiated a journey of reworlding and repair as framed by a feminist ecological approach to commoning, Residents are asked to reimagine the city and connect with each other in multi-species um, well-being. The very place of, of the wound. So in grafting, planting and caring for these trees, they also reclaim the places, communities and cities um, where they must grow. Neoliberal cities are quite simply unsustainable. So are the dominant geographical imaginaries that maintain them. Planting solutions to crises are market-based, driven by desires of future profit and justified by rational decisions, all of which maintain systems of disaster petrocapitalism. Western urban theorists that classify ground as property assume that time is inevitable and space is absolute, rather than co-created, experienced, remembered, and shared. Strategies of privatization Possessive individualism, sorting, segregation, and disavowal make invisible and silence past and ongoing forms of oppression, as well as the stories and places that offer them. 
more just alternatives. So with other feminist activists, artists and scholars, we reject the desperate belief that neoliberalism defines the entirety of our lived realities, subjectivities and shared worlds. Instead, we stand as allies with indigenous leaders who understand place as part of our shared heritage and responsibility and work to decolonize our minds, bodies, lands and waters. In so doing, we acknowledge how places and their multi-species ecologies at multiple scales have been and continue to be wounded by past and ongoing legacies of colonialism and other forms of state perpetuated violence. We also collaborate with others to realize spatial justice through imagining and acting the healthy places in which we want to live. So the project is really about creating alliance um, and connecting um, academics and researchers um, with community groups um, and then skill sharing, creating spaces of, um, of generosity um, and knowledge sharing. Um, and then connecting to um, an actual planting project. Some places may be created as function of fields of care, such as community gardens and orchards. These fields provide shared spaces for residents to relax, for pollinators to be protected and for multi-species to connect such as through seasonal change. We understand such places according to a feminist ethics of care and feminist ecologies of communing. Joan Tronto understands caring as species activity that conveys both a disposition and a set of actions. Amiria Puck de la Besca describes care as thick mesh of relational obligation. Toronto with Bernice Fisher defines care broadly to include everything that we do to maintain, continue and repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. That world includes our bodies, ourselves and our environment, all of which we seek to intervene, interweave in a complex life sustaining web. Webs of care are related to feminist ecological practices that draw upon relations of cooperation with and responsibility for each other and the earth, the forests, the sea and the animals, and reject forms of life and reproduction based upon the suffering of others. As Silvia Federici describes, creating feminist commons entails struggle and hard work but the result might teach the importance of community, including those of liberation and solidarity, of awakening and care and multi-species relations of social ecological repair and regeneration. So how might feminist ecologies of care and responsibility become possible in Inchicore, a gentrifying former working class part of Dublin that has experienced waves of disinvestment, stigma and chronic urban trauma? Hard graft at a time of extreme housing crisis, when city authorities offer gentrification rather than social housing, a small group of us began to um, make food forests and urban orchards. And then um, just something that I, I I'm quoted in saying, there's also there's something about trees and public space. I feel trees have more agency than a flat piece of lawn especially if people take ownership of that space or those trees. There are laws around getting permission to cut down trees. It's a way of holding onto public land by putting in trees. If you can bring people around to take ownership of the trees, then maybe identify, um, they may identify that space and um, protect it. So the actual social housing project pre-gentrification, um, sorry, which is this way, um, essentially was just lawn and um, a number of the community residents said they actually never felt, never would um, go out onto the lawn because they always felt like um, they were being watched. So definitely there was a need to introduce um, trees for shelter, biodiversity, um, shade, but also just um, um, well-being. So two orchards um, were planted through the hard graph project on that site. So 
So for the project, I received Citizen Artist Award from the community-based arts organization Common Ground in Studio 468. So Common Ground values art and culture for all in Irish life and has worked for the past 20 years to develop community-based art practices that include residencies for artists to work with residents in Dublin 8. This is an historically economically disadvantaged part of the city where in 2018, 19, sorry, local proposals for affordable housing were rejected by Dublin City Council in favor of gentrification initiatives such as purpose-built student housing and the privatization of green spaces. Along with socio-demographic change, this form of urban renewal is resulting in high rent zones, increased displacement, a rise in homelessness, and overall social um, instability. In this context, the project becomes even more of a challenge. So um, the project would not have been possible without Common Ground's commitment to supporting respectful relationships with local residents. So thinking about community gardens brought me to heritage seed, seed saving, and how we need to protect multi-species. Um, I met with community groups, the Men's Shed, and interested residents from Rialto and Inchicore who learnt from UCD Rosemount Research Station experts how to graft heritage apple trees. Here you can see this video is of um, Kevin Kenny, who was um, the lead um, caretaker and steward of the heritage um, orchards, and he taught us um, how to graft the fruit cheese trees. Grafting is a process of binding and waxing the join between the cadmium layers of skion and rootstock. So for me, the graft as the tree's rhizome offers a different organizational form, generating local organic modes of democracy in the face of more hierarchical, even authoritarian forms. Grafting together as a new community, stories and memories emerge in the process, including how as young boys, some participants robbed the priests' orchards. The fragile grafted trees initially were protected and allowed to heal in the safe spaces of the area's community gardens, after which they were planted out as new community orchards in, in Rialto and in Chicor. Reclaiming these new and old community spaces for trees asserts residents' right to their imagined common city. Imagining city streets as delicious, as Margareta so wonderfully puts it, um, and claiming land for trees as our political acts in Ireland. country which has the least forested woodland cover in all of Europe, reflecting the le legacies of colonial violence. At once a play space, a tree library, an opportunity for renewal, the orchard offers its residents fruits of shared labor, solidarity, and becoming with. So Hardgraft acknowledges the historical and ongoing, these are images of um, the planted um, graph, graphs then um, three years later. Hard graft acknowledges the historical and ongoing difficulties to be shared in facing our urban earth crises, while enacting a feminist urban ecology of thick co-presence, multi-species well-being and co co collaborative knowledge practices to make odkin of grafted heritage a network a new network of people learn to work with others, learning about heritage seed archives and how to graft, collaborating with other community groups and residents and planting orchards together, all of which contributed to the labors of repairing and reimagining our city. The project created hot compost piles of new life, transforming the orchard from a space of privilege to a hybrid field of care in areas considered by city officials as um, socially disadvantaged. Through grafting, a gardening practice that offers the possibilities of abundance and healing, residents now care for their trees, um, their places, and each other, and in the process may grow together with their future orchards and shared and more sustainable futures. So that essay again is um, taken from, um, is written by Karen Till, who is cultural geographer at um, 
Maynooth University. Um, and uh, a, a colleague and friend. We currently are in um, a feminist counter typographies um, reading group. Now I wanna kind of just move to where the project um, went from there. So through the, the planting of these um, orchards, and I mean, it's five small um, orchards from the grafted trees. Where this led me was to UCD geography and um, this team of um, geographers had mapped all of um, Dublin's um, urban tree canopy. So together we put in um, a proposal to work and look closely at um, Dublin 8 and this project became, is called Mapping Green Dublin. So this project was um, launched in 2020, just after the hard graph project. Um, we are geographers, artists, activists, and residents of Dublin. Mapping Green Dublin grew out of a desire to map and understand green space in Dublin and to identify issues acting as barriers to and opportunities for delivering real change. So drawing from our idea that tiny seeds can produce huge trees, we began at the scale of a particular neighborhood the goal of drawing lessons from the real life or lived experiences of inner urban communities that could help shape a new approach to greening. So this, um, we had a launch, a day long launch event, which had um, people mapping, doing community mapping, um, mapping deficits, um, strengths um, um, within the area, and then kind of putting in proposals for, ways things could be improved. And this was around kind of green space, but also um, traffic and um, navigation across the city. So we built a critical knowledge sharing space that allows for possibility of alliance, spaces for imagination, spaces for sustenance, spaces for action. Um, the knowledge on Dublin's tree canopy was shared with um, all in the community. So this is um, Professor Gerald Mills sharing that information. And here you can see a map of um, Dublin's um, tree um, density. And the area that we work in is that central sort of orange area, um, the Liberties. And that's the River Liffey that runs all the way um, through um, Dublin. And you can see Dolphin's Barn in there too. So the area we work in is of a very low um, tree density as can be seen from this um, these canopy mapping. And all the tree species within our, the study um, area were mapped. And the day event um, brought an artist project and practice luncheonette to bring and share food with the community. So creating these nourishing spaces of um, dialogue and sharing. And this, um, community mapping work was also led by um, uh, geographer Alma Claven. And it was important for us that the spaces were multi-generational. So that Mapping Green Dublin um, project, um, you can go to the website, just put in Mapping Green Dublin, you can see like all the maps and um, research that we created. But that project, um, Within that project too, we had COVID lockdown. So as part of the project, um, we created this project um, plots um, led by me, where people were encouraged to look at their two kilometer radius, which in within which we were all in stuck in in lockdown, and think about um, their area. So thinking about the hyper local and ways that they could improve um, greening within the area. So people shared um, this information through uh, the Google Maps app. So taking photos and uploading information. And um, we had a small um, exhibition within um, a green space in St. Michael's Estate. And again, um, another project that was mapped is the Camac Go a Long Way. So what I wanted to kind of share with you was just the way that 
a small project like um, Hard Graft, which began with grafting, has actually become quite a big project that in, has involved a number of um, agencies um, from community to academia to city council. Um, and we are collectively trying to improve um, green spaces, navigation, and sort of multi-species well-being from um, within kind of the neighborhood. So just to finish, um, we need to reworld, reimagine, relive, and reconnect with each other in multi-species well-being. The Earthbound can take heart as well as action. Thank you so much um, for the invitation. Um, and hopefully um, I'll get to meet some of you in the the future. But in the meantime, um, solidarity with all your um, wonderful work. Um, and goodbye from Dublin, Ireland. Good morning, or good evening to you. Welcome to the online stream of Grafters Exchange. I'm talking to you in the morning, but it's your evening. My name is Margareta Howitt, and I'm the principal artist and organizer behind Grafters Exchange. I'm very indebted to the ideas and energy, uh, collaborative labor of Marissa Preffer, Oliver Kellhammer, Greg Owens, and all of the artists involved with Grafters Exchange many of whom you'll see in these slides and all of whom are acknowledged in on the graftersexchange.org website. So Grafters Exchange began in 2019 and some of these early photographs you'll see in the slides are, are from that first year of incredible energy and enthusiasm. You can see Ellie Irons and Andrea Henji here beginning to do their asphalt cutout for staying with the trouble, generating a healing portal through the asphalt. So Grafters Exchange is a bioregional eco art event where fruit tree enthusiasts throughout central New York converge to share cyan wooden seeds, skills, fruit foods and art projects in a collaborative and interdisciplinary setting. I, I think it's fair to say that all of us are committed to ecological justice in the capital scene and on their ancestral legacies of multi-species collaboration and care. And just to say that Grafters Exchange emerges out of and exists in solidarity with the Gorilla Grafters going on its second decade of work um, the Gorilla Grafters are a self-selected and international workforce that graft fruit-bearing branches onto non-fruit-bearing ornamental fruit trees in the urban and post-industrial landscapes. So, like I said, Gorilla Grafters are a self-selected international workforce. It's very lateral, very anarchistic in its model. And... Um, um, I organized this project with Ian Pollock and Tara Hui insofar as we generate distributable materials, um, instructionals, do demonstrations, um, enact different kinds of radical pedagogies, um, and maintain the, the website. So, um, so yeah, so I, I personally, I was living in the Bay Area in the urban context doing Gorilla Grafters and then moved to central New York to a rural landscape and really wanted to understand the dynamics of property in a rural context, understanding that that determines how food forests can or cannot happen. Um, and, um, yeah, I wanted to understand what a radical food forestry or a, um, a tactical guerrilla food forestry would look like in the rural context. And um, also wanted to sort of think about the relationship across rural, post-industrial and urban landscapes and the ways that folks within these different contexts could, could share resources to generate more 
more ecologies, more food forests across these spaces, wanting to use the, the abundance, the potential abundance within the rural context, especially to support those in the urban context. So I started Grafters Exchange to begin to ask those questions and to begin to explore those possibilities. Um, and yeah, so again, just seeing images from 2019 here. And just to say also that um, because of this sort of lateral horizontal project of the Guerrilla Grafters, um, I want to continue that ethos with Grafters Exchange and um, always consider distributed and decentralized network models as um, possible components or aspects of resiliency. And also not only thinking about grafting quite literally as a mode of um, preservation of different fruit varietals um, as a way of um, thinking about especially preserving varietals in the context of climate change, um, increasing food yields in the area, increasing biodiversity, but also thinking about grafting as a metaphor for different kinds of connections across difference and um, connections that, that uh, enable resource to pulse through them. So um, also understanding digital protocological connections as potential kinds, as a kind of graft. So mesh networks, peer-to-peer -peer communications, other ways of embedding information locally are always welcome topics this year and in future years. And um, tonight we heard from Julian Staden, who's been working on the teleagriculture project. Um, and he's bringing that project to us in central New York next month. So yeah, so thinking about grafting in, um, in the rural context, these are some images of paragraphs on wild hawthorn. So thinking about utilizing the wild hawthorn as a kind of living fence to protect the desirable pear fruit. Um, Oliver Kellhammer and I have and I have talked a lot about the people's pear. It's such a delicate fruit. It's usually very expensive in markets, but can we tap into the ruderal sort of vitality of, of the hawthorn um, to produce a kind of people's pear in the rural context? Yeah, and so these are some images now that you're seeing of, of the Gorilla Grafters um, work for the past decade. So one of the things that we think a lot about with the Gorilla Grafters is the ways that um, um, scarcity is generated in our public landscapes um, or in our public environments, um, the ways that uh, the dynamics between public and private property generate a sense of, um, of inaccessible natures for people that aren't the elites or that don't have private property. And wanting to gesture, right, to use this term that the artist Ricardo Dominguez gives us, wanting to gesture towards other worlds, um, gesture towards the possibility of, of the commons, of multi-species commons, understanding the commons to be spaces of shared resources and cooperative labor to, to cite Peter Leinbaugh, one of our great theorists of the commons. So the commons is neither public nor private property. It's some, something else. Um, you certainly can have usufruct practices, right? Where one person has more of a claim on the yield of a certain, of a certain plant or of a certain area because they are more deeply, um, they tend to it, right? But there aren't these hard boundaries between public and private that generate in scarcity, scarce publics, right? Um, also understanding the dynamics of public and private to um, also reinforce these, these binaries of modernity, right? 
binaries between mind and body, um, man, woman, civilized, savage, right? And most importantly, probably, or most foundationally, um, society and nature, right? And understanding all of these, these binaries support private property, support the, um, the domination and management of the bourgeoisie, support, um, support uh, the concept of civilized, the concept of man, the concept of society at the expense of nature, savage, other. Yeah, so, so the work of Grafters Exchange, the work of guerrilla grafters is always keeping the commons in mind, right? An alternative way of, of managing resource, redistributing resources and working together. And wanting to propose that that work is always going to be, or not always, but um, probably, <laughs> probably, We'll always have a in within this um, within this society, right? Within a neoliberal society, within a capitalist society, um, when push comes to shove, there's always going to be something that needs to be tactical that is going to exist outside of legal frameworks, right? Understanding that legal frameworks support support property relations. Um, so, yeah. So in the publication this year. Um, I have a provocation to think about tactical food forestry, um, thinking about how it can happen sort of slowly over many years, um, slowly and sneakily. Um, can think about inoculating logs with edible mushrooms, introducing medicinal plants and edible plant companions to existing ecologies, tucking in the Hedenoshani planting technology known as corn beans and squash or the three sisters. Um, um, understanding that many invasive species are some of our strongest medicines for the, um, the diseases of the 21st century. Um, understanding that all of this cultivation, this sort of non-hierarchical cultivation is about cultivating a terrain from which we can renew ourselves in between acts of resistance against systemic violence so that our larger networks of more than human kin can thrive. Right, so understanding that in order to, to resist and overthrow, overgrow capitalism, to enact abolitionist landscapes as Jackie Simmel taught us last night, um, that we always need a place from which to renew ourselves in order to continue to do this, this resistance. And, um, and we can do that by cultivating these, these tactical commons that exist in secret or hidden behind uh, a tangle or a bramble. Yeah, so um, in closing, I just want to recognize that this work happens on um, Oneida territory, that um, the Oneida are part of the larger Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Um, here we have a glacial rock, um, which is also an upright stone. And um, Oneida means people of the upright stone. Uh, and we, as we were told during the, um, the talk by Anandaga food forester and knowledge keeper, Angela Ferguson, last weekend, um, we were reminded by an Oneida woman who was um, at the talk that um, yeah, this upright stone is a, a glacial rock. It still holds the cold inside of it if you touch it, um, right? So, so we do this work on, on Oneida territory, um, on 
the Haudenosaunee Confederacy territory, recognizing that um, this is the land of some of the first democracies um, and that this land has never been ceded. Um, and just putting it out there that, um, that these land acknowledgements should be, or it's my intention in doing this land acknowledgement that um, it, it paves the way for, for very real reparations um, for the indigenous peoples that, that continue on these very important traditions of, of food forestry and, um, and democracy. So thank you so much for tuning in and I hope to see you at the upcoming talks with Jason Moore on Friday, um, ongoing online streams for the next couple of days and um, upcoming walks later in the day on Friday and our final sign exchange on Saturday. Root arms. Root arms. Root arms. Root arms. Root arms rearm a rearming. Eighth day of war. An armature. Arms deployed. My arms around. Root arms. Armed forces. Arms force. The army. Cluster bombs. Gardens, hospitals. How to handle war, ground rules, cities shelled, shells for shores. How to get a handle on war, no together to get here. How to handle root arms, my hands. I teach children, hands plant seeds, make beauty, make friends. Make delicious, what power. Firearm here, firearm there. Fires, arm bottles, alcohol, gasoline flung. I am armless, I am armless. I am armless, I am face to face to face tank. I am hands on tank, stop. I am tank, I am stop giving birth, bomb shelters, giving birth, basements, giving air, giving air, giving air, giving air over Ukraine. Close the sky, close skies closed, plants planted over, nuclear plants planted, Chernobyl melts. Who handles, who measures, root arms? Root arms. The cherry tree hangs a root arm.